Okay, water retention landscapes. Beautiful. Good morning, everyone. Uh, feel free to ask questions as we're going through if anything comes up. And otherwise, we'll just keep rolling. So first question is why? Why water retention landscapes? Why is this something that's important? Why is it something that you hear talked about a lot? And why are we talking about it today? So this is a beautiful city, Bogota, uh, you know, looking out over it. But if you look, it's really important to look around and see what's all around. What, what kind of impact are we creating on the landscape? If you look everywhere that you go, there's human impact drying out the landscape. This whole city is designed to drain the water away as quickly as possible. And you see, all, not only is it draining the water that hits the valley, but all of this water, like Paul was just talking about, the drops in the mountains is going down into this valley, is also being drained away as quickly as possible into the ocean, taking all the fertility, sediment, all the valuable things that the water brings with it, the nitrogen that it's pulling from the air, are all just getting washed away. All the houses that we have, all the roads that we build, look at human impact in every city, 90% of it is desertifying the landscape. Now, not just does this cause a problem right where it is, but if you think this whole area, no water is infiltrating into this whole area now. So not only is it degrading this landscape, but it's also degrading everything downstream because the water that used to infiltrate into this valley that was most assuredly full of wetlands and all different types of water landscapes is now not going into the earth. And so not only is this destroying this landscape, it's destroying downhill of it. It's drying up springs, it's drying up creeks, it's drying up rivers. It's causing a lot of damage throughout the whole system. And so what can we do? This is really going to be the focus of this topic, this presentation. What can we do to improve this situation, to offset some of the different things that we've done? Uh, if you imagine what used to be on the landscape, this is an old growth cypress swamp I got to visit. This is Big Mama. It's a tree that was here before Columbus arrived on the continent. It's still around, but only because it's in a very hard to harvest area. And most of the big cypress logs in this area were hollow. So trying to imagine what used to be on this landscape is a really big important part of working with the landscape, figuring out what possibilities are on the table, what we can do in the future to help improve this situation. And if you imagine all the beautiful systems that used to be here, we only see scratches and little remains of what used to be. The natural for national forests that we visit, most of them have already been logged several times, but because that's our closest common relation to what used to be on the landscape, we think of them as entirely natural. That's where the conservation movement stems from, and so you start to get into this idea where we have these forests that are already in a highly degraded state, but it's the best thing we have. So now we want to set them aside and not touch them, which actually oftentimes further degrades the system. And so with all of this, we really want to look at not just what's on the landscape right now, but what used to be here, what could be here in the future, and what are the best ways to partner with the landscape to achieve your goals. So this brings me to Victor Schauberger and the concept of the full water cycle and the half water cycle. And this was in the early 1900s that he was doing his work. So if you think a lot has changed from then to now, but he was already seeing a lot of the really big problems that we have. So I've been living in Bozeman, which used to be known as the Valley of Flowers. It was a valley full of expansive wetlands, water features, rivers. All these rivers flooded the banks every year. And you had this giant filtration system that was feeding everything downhill. This was known as a sacred valley where you had to lay your arms at the entrance of the valley because there were all sorts of medicines that grew in these wetland systems that didn't grow anywhere else in the state. And so something, several hundred different tribes actually claimed this valley because they would all come there at a time of year to harvest all the medicines. Now this valley is full of development. Most of the wetlands have been drained. Probably one third of the water surface that used to exist still does. And so it's important to really look at what, what used to be and what could be. And so when we think of the water cycle, the mountains are really our collection feature. They're condensing all of the rainfall, making the clouds drop their moisture, and then putting that into the lower areas of the landscape. So mountains are a really important piece of this. 
and they're one of the few features that we haven't really disturbed hydrologically because it's very hard to get up there. We would if we could, but places like Chimborazo, 20,000 feet, you know, you can, you're only going to go so high to mine resources and materials and to modify the landscape. Then this drops down into the forest, which is a really important part of the hydrological cycle and something that's not thought about very often. The temperature of the soil in relation to the falling rain has a really big effect as far as how that water infiltrates into the soil. So in a forest where the soil is shaded, the warm rainfall can really penetrate into the cool soil. And so this is what's known as the full water cycle. That water goes into the earth, it soaks the earth body, it travels along underground pathways, and it eventually comes back up in the forms of creeks, rivers, springs. So these forests are really our charging mechanism for the body of the earth. Uh, yep? Because that was a bit of a, a moment for me. So the temperature relationship of the soil, so what's the mechanism that actually makes it absorb more quickly into the, into the percolate into the soil <coughs> if it's warmer? Um, well, so it's, it's more a relation between the temperature of the water and the temperature of the soil. Yep. And so if you think, you know, I don't know the actual mechanisms, okay. but I just know the hands-on experience where if you think, for example, you know, take a really hot baked clay landscape, yep. pour water over it, it all just runs down. Yep. It's getting baked hard like a clay pot or even like a hot plate, water just glances right off of it. Whereas when you have a nice cool, I, I liken it to a sponge. If the sponge is yep. dried and baked out, the water you can, runs off. exactly. Yep. If yep. it's cool and already a little bit moist, it soaks it right in. Same kind of thing with the soil. So if that soil is shaded and is cooler than the falling rain, it can really absorb mm -hmm. right in. Okay. And I'm sure it has something to do with the ionic properties of organic yeah. matter. And also the, the, the pathways of heat. Mm -hmm. So there would be heat transferring from the water to the, to the soil if the water's warmer than the soil. Yep, yep, yep. Cool. yep. Uh, and then the fungi are a very important <laughs> piece of this hydrological cycling as well. Uh, they really help with the infiltration of water because they open up all these different pathways, they actually move it around, they actually create water in the soil in certain ways. And this is another thing that's being really disturbed by poor forestry practices. And then you get to the creeks and the rivers and the babbling brooks, and all of these are really important areas. Deep, cold, clear water where a lot of the bacteria that actually clean the water are living in and around these rocks and on the surface area of them. So this is one of our filtration mechanisms as well. And so what we have instead of this full water cycle that really the rain falls, it infiltrates into the ground, it comes back up, it evaporates, and it feeds the cycle. What we've been in for the last hundred years, and much more than that even, is more of the half water cycle, where you cut the forests, and so what happens is that falling rain, instead of infiltrating, now the soil surface is exposed, it's hot, it's baked dry, all that water just runs off. And so now instead of infiltrating into the earth and feeding those creeks and rivers, it's just running along the surface, causing floods, making areas of water that's really flat, wide, and expansive, increasing evaporation, and so one flood leads to the next, and you get into this cycle of intense events that are less common, and so you're getting more drought and more flooding through this half-water cycle. You're getting not only are you getting the problems with flooding, but your water table is actually sinking as well, which is counterintuitive because you're not putting that water into the earth. It's staying right on top of the surface instead of actually entering the living body of the earth. And so this is a quote from Plato. This was more than 2,400 years ago. Keep that in mind. The land was the best in the world. There are, only, there are remaining only the bones of the wasted body, all the richer and softer parts of the soil having fallen away, the mere skeleton of the land being left. In the primitive state of the country, its mountains were high hills covered with soil, and the plains were full of rich earth, and there was abundance of wood in the mountains. Of this last, the traces still remain, although some of the mountains now only afford sustenance to bees. 
The land reaped the benefit of the annual rainfall, not as now losing the water which flows off the bare earth into the sea, but having an abundant supply in all places, providing everywhere abundant fountains and rivers. Such was the natural state of the country, which was cultivated by lovers of honor and of a noble nature, and had a soil the best in the world, an abundance of water, and in the heaven above, an excellently attempered climate. This was over 2,000 years ago that he's talking about this environmental degradation, this desertification caused by humans. And so it's really hard to imagine when you picture the changes that have happened over the last 1,000 years, after the last even longer than that, where are we at now as opposed to where we used to be? And you see a lot of landscapes that have been specifically drained because they used to have too much water and now they have problems with drought because this last piece of it is something I want to pull apart just real quickly. An, excellent, an excellently a tempered climate. So one of the things that this full water cycle is doing is actually creating a more smooth, steady climate more consistent rainfall, lighter rainfall events, but for the last over 2,000 years, we've been creating this feedback loop that's leading to more flood, more drought, more extreme weather events, and more difficulty cultivating the landscape. And so when we really think about this watershed from the very top all the way down into the ocean, humans three quarters of our action or more is really designed at taking all that water, moving it away as quickly as possible, leading to further flooding in the lowland areas, leading to more severe storms with less frequency. Uh, and so now we're going to move forward into really... Oh, another thing I want to touch on real quick is that stress is the root of all disease. We oftentimes really just try and treat the symptoms of disease rather than the actual root of disease. And I actually think that CO2 and climate change, global warming, is actually a symptom of the severe disturbance of the hydrological cycling of the planet. And so to try and just treat the CO2 is missing the real stress at the root of the disease, which is the water cycling of the planet. How do we address that? If we address that, we're going to get more growth. We're going to get more carbon sequestration. And the natural buffering systems are going to come back into place. Uh, you know, I'm not presenting any full solutions, but I think to focus on CO2 rather than H2O is missing the main point. It's focusing on the symptom rather than the real stress of the disease. And so one of the projects I'm going to hit on first is Tamara. Uh, this is in Portugal, and it's a project where they had a very severely degraded system. They had basically a road built through the lowlands of this valley. And so this is a community that goes between 150 and 250 people, 150 year-round, 250 in the summer season. And they used to be on a deep borehole well that barely produced enough water for the community. They didn't have any water for gardens or anything like that. And now this is what exists on that landscape. Over a pretty short order, they've gone from being a very degradative community to a very regenerative community where they're putting more water <coughs> into the ground than they're actually using. Uh, and so, what's that? How much time passed? Two um, it, so it took two or three years for this lake to fill up. Uh, this is probably four years in between these photos, maybe? Wow. <coughs> And so this is an aerial of part of the community. This is that big dam that they put in. This is one of the two ponds that Sepp Holzer put in in the system, and then they put in a third one later. And so this community went from being in a deep borehole well, a very degradative way of harvesting water. If you liken the earth to the body of a human and draw that analogy, how long would we survive if our skin was dehydrated? So we pulled out blood and sprayed it on the surface that's a pretty destructive situation. <laughs> and it's going to get worse and worse pretty quickly, if you draw that analogy. And so now they're on shallow wells and a spring that was all, they're replenishing the watersheds that they're using. And instead of pulling from this deep historic aquifer, they're pulling from water that they're directly putting into the system each year. Another important thing is they're not just storing water. This is a climate that gets almost no precipitation for 11 months out of the year. And then they get pretty significant, you know, ranging from uh, 
250 milliliters to uh, or millimeters to um, 600 in a really heavy year, which is they get. Uh, I think they get like about six inches in a really dry year and 14 in a really wet year. Um, and so they're not only storing water from the wet part of the season to the dry part of the season, but from the wet years to the dry years. So they can have a year where they only get 200 millimeters of precipitation, but they still have enough water because they stored it from two years ago when they had 600 millimeters that year. So it's really important not just thinking your water budget throughout the year, but your water budget from year to year, over the course of five years, over the course of 10 years. Uh, and it's, it's a beautiful place, a beautiful community. These are some flow forums they have at the lower end. Uh, and then, uh, you know, it's just, it's a beautiful ecosystem now in a really barren, barren, dying cork oak landscape. You're driving through this very near desert. It's drier than the Andalusia climate. And it, then you come into this oasis and there's all the water they can use. They have more water than they could use. They have plenty of clean drinking water. They have water for the environment, the animals, the gardens. Does this regenerated landscape represent what, it, what used to be there beyond 2,000 years ago? That's a great question. Uh, it's What's the fossil record? It's say? hard to, so that's actually, that brings up a couple of different questions. There is, the idea of restoring a landscape to what it used to be. Now this, if you go back here, you know, at one point, this is where the water is moving through the landscape. So it was likely, it was closer to a wetlands before it was a road, most assuredly. Oh, okay. Was it a big lake like that? Probably not. But what we're trying to do is look at the situation as a whole and then look at our piece of property and what can we do on this piece of property to affect the situation as a whole. Mm -hmm. And so actually when they were building this, everyone in the area was all up in arms about it. They said, you're taking all of our water, you can't do this. They got the police involved. They tried to do everything they could to stop it. And now they love it because instead of flood for one month and drought for 11, they have a consistent steady spring fed by these water retention landscapes mm -hmm. because it's very important these are not with a liner, these are not with concrete, these are with earthen materials. And so it's holding the water in the body of the earth and actually feeding it back into the body of the earth. So this actually rehydrated old spring lines that at one point were a spring, probably fed by what was a wetland in this area. Now there's this big lake in this area feeding that spring. And so we're not, gonna be, we're not ever going to be able to restore all the landscape to the way it used to be. There's lots of wetlands that have been dredged, that have been developed. You're not going to rip out everyone's home and turn that back into a, into a wetland. And so what can we do in the areas that we can work to not only enhance that situation, but also offset this other situation? And so what I'm oftentimes looking at is looking at what a landscape used to be from a water perspective and then how can we maximize that maybe even en enhance it from where it ever used to be to offset some of the other environmental degradation all around can you orient me on this photo i got the connection to the front to right yep um so this is that yurt uh, okay yeah and this is the dam what you're really looking for is how to maximize your water enhancement for the earthwork you're doing. So if you think they really just had to build a little dam here to create this whole water body. And so if you compare the amount of earth moved to the amount of water stored, you're in a really good ratio with a situation like this. So that's where you're really looking to put your ponds. I really don't like, I see so many projects where people get led astray by the permaculture idea of hold water as high as you can on the landscape. Yeah, that's great if the place is high on the landscape makes sense, but you got to first look at where's the natural positions on the landscape to hold water. Where can you maximize your energy and economic input for the water retained? And oftentimes that's not on the highest parts of the landscape. That's in the valleys and the drainages and in the key points. Uh, and so this is actually the bottom of this landscape where they put in this water feature because it wouldn't be possible at the top. What were the potential negative impacts in the, in the studies phase of downstream of this water retention? This is, um, 
a Sepulcher project. And so there's, and we'll get more into this with the talk this evening, but he really, I think one of his favorite terms is theory cripples. And so he, <laughs> he doesn't, I think a lot of times people get so tied up with the theory and the analysis and they get stuck in analysis paralysis and nothing ever happens. And he's really good at just coming in, making it happen, making it happen quick. And so I don't think there were any studies done. They just were looking at how can we restore this watershed? How can we make this community water sustainable? And even regenerative would be even better. And so they just went ahead and did it. And uh, they're one of the best examples in the world now. And, uh, you know, a lot of, they probably would have, it probably would, if they had gone into the study phase, it would have never happened because they would have said, oh, this is going to impact creeks downstream and all these other things. But then the net effect, once it's actually in place, is a positive, not just for this community, but for everyone downstream as well. Now all the flooding is mitigated and now they have slow, steady, consistent water, how you can use it, available in the dry times, available in the wet times. And so it's a beautiful place, I highly recommend visiting. Uh, you know, the water level fluctuates quite a bit throughout the seasons because you're just getting one month of rainfall and then 11 months of evaporation. And s but they still have plenty of water for gardens, it's a very beautiful place. They're doing a lot of interesting things besides just this, they have a lot of alternative technology stuff from biogas digesters to greenhouses running a sterling motor to all sorts of really interesting stuff. I highly recommend it for anyone. If you're over in Europe, go for a visit. And so this was done by my mentor, rebel farmer, international visionary, one of my favorite human beings on the planet. A really strong, powerful guy. You know, don't get in his way with anything or you're going to get mowed right over. And so I'm really fortunate that I get to come in after he did a lot of this backbreaking litigation and opened up these pathways, provided these successful projects so that you can just point to them. And then it makes a lot of it a lot easier to convince different authorities, to convince different parties if there's something you can point to on the landscape and say, hey, look at this, look at what they did, look at the long-term effects. Now we can start to build that credibility in that long-term portfolio. And so he started out at the Kramerhof, which was his family farm. His father gave it to him. Is it's a, an Austrian tradition that the firstborn son takes over the family farm. And so when he took it over, he had spent his whole life playing in the dirt. He really loved everything from growing salamanders to all these different plants to making little ponds. He was a kid just playing in nature as we often do if we're presented the opportunity to do so. And so once he took it over, he had all these grandiose ideas that he started implementing. And a lot of people thought he was crazy. Uh, the, you know, there's stories of his dad being in the bar down in the town and everyone saying, your son is ruining your farm. What are you doing? You got to stop him. And he said, it's his farm now. You know, it's, it's out of my hands. And legally it was. And so everyone thought he was crazy until he created what is really this paradise on a mountainside and now everyone wants it. And so on this land, 45 hectares, which is about 120 acres of what was really, con it's a rocky, steep hillside way up in the mountains. It's hard to fathom how high up in the mountains it is until you go there. And it was really, it was even poor pasture. It was really thought of as just kind of scrub land for growing pine monoculture and for growing some grains and things of that nature. And he created this beautiful oasis of 72 interconnected ponds and lakes, a whole aquaculture, a whole agroforestry system, and this farm that's incredibly productive as a farm, just on its own right. It's incredibly valuable as a teaching tool as well. And then it's incredibly valuable as a, a beacon and a place for people to see and start to bring these ideas to their own landscape. And so water is the chief element. Water is the ultimate capital of any farm. And so he really looked at how to maximize water retention on the farm. And it's, it's just a beautiful place that at this point, these systems are going and no one could be on the farm for 10 years and it's going to be producing a lot of food. It's going to be a really vital habitat for all the wilderness around, all the wildlife, and then you could come back to it and start cultivating it again at any point in time. 
And so it's really going back to that full water cycle. This is really the full water cycle embodied, where there are terraces covered in trees that are infiltrating that water, and then there are water retention features collecting and storing that water so that you're really charging and putting as much of that water into the Earth's body as possible so that four or five meters deep, the Earth's body is charged with water and with life. And this gives you kind of an idea of the layout. Usually the terraces are more overgrown than this, but this is an area where they're uh, transitioning or revitalizing an old orchard. And so you get an idea of the terraces are infiltrating water, and then they're also safely moving that water to different storage points, mitigating erosion, and then the trees themselves are established usually on the embankments of the terraces so that this continues to be an access way. It's an area where you could grow annual crops, where you could do tillage agriculture if you need to. The other thing I really like about terrace systems as opposed to swale systems is that if, if a monoculture farmer buys this place for whatever reason, this is a steep mountainside, he wants to grow, let's say he wants to grow wheat. So he wants to till it all up and plant a bunch of wheat. In a terrace system, he has lots of areas to do this. And it's actually quite simple to do it because his access ways are also areas that he can till as agriculture. If that same farmer buys a farm that's been swaled, first thing he's probably doing is cutting down all the trees, pushing the swales flat so that he can come through and till it all. So I like to envision when designing landscapes, design not just for you and your current uses, but for who might end up with the landscape past you and how many different options can you build into the table so that it's as flexible as possible. Uh, how do you control or decide how much water is going to flow through that landscape? Because there's always, there's always a point where too much of good things are bad mm -hmm. thing. Because I mean 50% of productive soil is, is air mm -hmm. and by having too mm -hmm. much water. I mean I've worked on a property where there was huge water infiltration features and yep. so the soil was waterlogged and was going, you know, anaerobic yep. and yep. so <coughs> controlling, <coughs> controlling that, that water in the landscape. And that's, that's a really good point because none of this is on contour. Zero percent of it. You know, the, the dams and the lakes obviously are. But as far as the terraces, they're all slightly in or out and they're all slightly pitched this way, some more than others because they're also access features. And so what you're doing is you're creating areas that are more moist in the heel of these terraces and then areas that are drier as well in the toe of these terraces. And then it's, you know, when the first falling rain is coming, it's really just infiltrating because you're working <coughs> with like one to three percent grades. But then once the water hits soil carrying capacity, water carrying capacity, it starts to sheet off and gently flow. And so really, like you're saying, that's a really important thing is, and not just that, but also looking at the context and where you are. This is a pretty rainy place, actually. Um, they get about 20 inches of precipitation, 24 a year. And so it's, you know, you can have too much of water, definitely. And so it's not these on contour ditches just holding all that water. It's a system designed to infiltrate the water when the soil is dry. Then as the soil fills up, it moves and gently moves to the different water retention features. You've got these steps and they're the bits that the water's pulsing in. Yep. Whereas if you've got a mm -hmm. swale, the water will lend to the surface and there's no jutting features to give that contrast. So it's yeah. just like... Yeah, yeah, hits yeah. Hits the surface and then it travels below the surface. Yeah, exactly. Does his property, um, is it represented in the past best by what we see in the background? Those um, open areas on the, the mountainside? No, that's all clear cut. Um, is so that what his looked like? Well, so this is, this is, it was all planted pine monoculture. His property. His property. Okay. And <laughs> almost all of Austria's planted pine monoculture. It wasn't, when you go way back, it was more of a mixed culture with lots of deciduous, lots of conifers, uh, lots of different trees. But when it was all imperially, royally owned, they did these big plantations. And the foresters that are trained in Austria know exactly what they're doing. They're creating a system that's not natural, that's not sustainable, that's going to collapse. They know very well it's going to collapse. What they're trying to do is grow, because it's the quickest thing to yield a good marketable timber. 
And so what they're trying to do is grow it up as much as they can, and right before the collapse point, they want to come in and mow it all down and clear cut it. And so that was traditionally what was done with most of Sepp's landscape. You know, they had a little area when he was growing up. They, they did some animals, they did some grains, they did some stuff, but most of his farm was planted pine monoculture that he was actually fined for removing. He was fined for planting fruit trees. He was fined for all of this, uh, but because that's the tradition. And it's been so long held that people think of Austria as, oh, these beautiful natural pine monocultures, but they're planted. And a lot of them are actually planted in rows. And you can walk through the forest and just see perfect rows of trees because they were very deliberately planted landscapes. Mm -hmm. Well, we're talking about what came before. Could you speak a little bit to the climate, like seasons, yeah. yep. snowfall, rainfall? Yep. Um, so the mean annual precipitation is four and a half degrees Celsius, which is about, I think, 45 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm going to get my conversions all messed up, but we'll go with rough averages. Uh, you know, it gets as cold as about negative 20 Fahrenheit in a really cold year, negative 15. It doesn't get that hot in the summer, so they're very limited from a sun perspective. And they get a lot of rainfall in the spring, and then usually not much in the summer. Um, they get, you know, about 600 to 800 millimeters, about 20 to 24 inches, something like that, throughout the year. A long cold season. I, I forget the number of days, but very limited number of days above, I think it's like two a year that get above 80 degrees Fahrenheit or just a handful. So they're mostly, even in the summer, they're in that 50s to 80s How range. Sunny is it? Not, not very sunny. That's one of their limiting factors, particularly in the spring. It gets a little bit more so, but they have a lot of overcast days. Okay. Um, and then another thing that usually isn't part of the story, is that this mountain, Schwartz Mountain, actually has a bunch of moors up at the top of it. So actually these, these wetland systems. So there's a water, lot of water moving through the mountainside itself as well. That's a great question. Um, I can't remember. 3,500, it's 1,500 meters. Okay, okay, so yeah. 3,000, yeah. so yeah, almost, yeah, yeah. 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 And this actually gives you some perspective. Ramingstein down in here in the valley is the one of the coldest towns in Austria. It's called the Siberia of Austria. And they're way up here. So they're really in a in a really cold uh, used to be barren landscape, but have created this beautiful oasis. And so a really important thing to think about when you're building water retention landscapes is the zones of aquaculture. These are the areas that you need to have incorporated into a water feature to have a really nice vital water feature. Now these constrictions are gonna change as far as how much of the different areas you want based on climate, but you always wanna have these three zones in some kind of relation with each other. The first is the float zone. Anywhere where you hear water moving. These are the areas where water is being actively aerated it's also usually going over spillways or rocks or different areas where the bacteria that clean the water are living. And so that's a really important part of the system. The flow of water, the movement of water actually helps provide a lot of the cleaning for the water. The next zone is the flat zone, which is an area a meter, so three feet deep or less, the photic zone of the pond. This is where all of the plants are going to live. This is where the sediment is going to be combed from the water. The nutrient is going to be filtered from the water. Also a really important filter mechanism. And when you think of aquaculture, a very important area as far as producing food for the fish. So a lot of aquaculture operations are actually fish negative, where they use so much fish food, they harvest more fish from the ocean than they actually produce at the end of the operation. These systems are entirely natural aquaculture systems where you're actually growing the food so all the insects and plants and uh, 
small organisms and crustaceans, you're actually growing in these hot ponds, these shallow ponds that then feed into larger systems where you have more of the fish. And so you can have these hotter ponds as also fish nurseries, but where you're bringing the water temperature up and you're really growing a lot of stuff. So in a very arid climate, you still need a flat zone, but you want to minimize it because you don't want to raise the temperature of the water too much and increase evaporation. Whereas in a cold climate, you want a lot of flat zone because you want to get that water temperature up to increase the activity, to increase the productivity so that you get more, <coughs> whether you want to swim in warmer water or whether you want to produce more fish, you're, you're modifying the proportions of each of these different zones based on the climate that you're working in. Yeah, typically it's seven pound of ocean caught fish to raise one pound of um, farmed fish. So you're better off eating the fish they catch to make yeah. the fish meal. Exactly. Mm -hmm. If we could just convince people to eat smaller fish. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> question. Uh, so the average is supposed to be a meter deep on this type of system, correct? Oh, it's it's up to a meter deep. Up to a meter. Deep. So that's basically the photic zone where light is going to be able right. to penetrate into the pond, and so you'll have different plants in the different areas. You know, the areas that are a meter deep, you're really only going to get lilies and a few other things can grow in that deep of water. But the flat zone is also a lot of areas much shallower than that, where you get the sedges and the rushes and the different wetlands plants, cattails, things of that nature. Um, so it's usually it's kind of a slow, steady gradient out to one meter. So in the winter, uh, assuming this is going to freeze, it, it must not freeze clear at the bottom even if it's only a meter deep? Uh, it depends on your place, but usually you're in a pretty cold place if you get a meter of ice on top yeah. of the surface. But, you know, they probably get that some years up here, okay. um, maybe even most years. But then you also have the deep zone, which is the third zone of aquaculture, okay. which is where you're, I really consider this three meters or more in depth. So 10 feet or more is great, 12 feet, 15 feet. The basically, the deeper you get, the better. And what you're getting is you're getting water at its most structured. So water is most dense at 4.5 degrees Celsius, about 45 degrees Fahrenheit. And so what you have happen is all of, and water has the highest oxygen holding capacity at its most dense. And it also actually takes on these beautiful crystalline structures, because water is a very strong dipole. It has a strong charge, you know, it has an oxygen and two hydrogens, and has a really strong positive and negative charge. So it actually develops these structures, uh, the different ways it forms. Now those structures that water holds also determine how quickly it can pass through another strong dipole, cellular membranes. And so having that reservoir of this deep charged oxygenated water actually is increasing at the rate at which life processes can happen. So it's a really key part of the system. It's also the area that in the winter, all of the fish are going to migrate down to that deep zone where they have access to oxygen, they have a warmer temperature. And then in the summer, when it's way too hot at the top and oxygen levels are low, they're again going to migrate down into those deep zones where they have enough oxygen, where they have that cool charged water. Um, and then you also get overturn where basically every year, twice a year, when the water cools or warms up to that temperature, you get the mixing of all the water, which is also very important. I'll, I'll get there in a second. So if the flat ponds are shallow and they freeze in the winter, mm -hmm. and that's where the fish food, where, what do the fish eat in the winter? You know, they're going almost dormant. They're getting... So the... The other thing is any good pond has all three of these zones mixed in, not just one. Um, so oftentimes, you know, any big pond that has a deep zone is also going to have a shallow zone, <coughs> whereas some of the shallow hot ponds may have a very small deep zone or a pretty minimal one. So those ones are really going to go totally dormant in the winter, and fish may not be able to overwinter at all in those, whereas the deeper ones still have that flat zone. But as the fish really cool down, they're becoming much less active. They're eating a lot less. Um, so that's kind of how you get through the winter. One of the maxims in aquaculture is if there's any problem at all, is stop feeding your fish. You know, they don't have to support their own weight. They don't have to regulate their own body temperature. So you know, one yeah. of the main problems with 
um, fish in, in homes is people massively overfeed them. So mm -hmm. they can go months with almost nothing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is there a shape of the retention ponds that encourages this cycle more than others? Uh, yes, so uh, that is very important to have natural shapes. And so you don't want any corners. Corners end up being a dead zone. And even just having a nice circular pond, this actually brings me to the next slide, it's very important to have a lot of textured habitat to provide areas for different things to hide out from the fish food to the small fish. So if you have a perfectly circular pond, you're going to have good water circulation throughout the area, but what's going to happen is you have no texture for the small fish to hide out in. And so you're only going to be able to have one size of fish because the big fish are going to eat the smaller fish until there are no more, until they exhaust them. Whereas having all of these textured areas, places for things to hide out, now you can start to have a more natural water system where you have different sizes of fish. So the more varied, the more natural, the better. You actually want to provide areas where water is flowing through more and areas where it's flowing through less and provide as many different options for habitat as possible. So it's not that there's a set shape. You do want to avoid corners. You do want to avoid just having a circular open pond, but really you want to work as much as possible with the shape of the landscape that's there. So you're moving as little earth as you need to to get the job done and you're getting a nice natural curvy shape. Sep always gets mad, even if it's just in a drawing. If you do a straight dam. This originated in <coughs> Austria, the conversion of chemical pools to living pools. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Is, was Sep involved in, in that project? No, I don't believe so. Um, but the company Biotope is actually, they do all sorts. I just visited when I was over there, I visited a couple of their different projects. Um, and it's, they're using, you know, they have these three systems built into it, basically, where they have a float zone, they have a flat zone, and they have a deep zone. Um, and they're really trying to keep as little nutrient in the water as possible, which for most water systems, you don't want a lot of nutrient in the water. It'll promote the growth of algae, which is a good thing, but consumes oxygen. And so you got to have it in balance. Um, but I don't, I don't think he was involved at all with the development of those because a lot of them are uh, too cornered. <laughs> <laughs> they have a lot of corners and square and, you oh. know, he wouldn't, he wouldn't stand for that. Okay. <laughs> he would get very upset <laughs> for good reason, too. Cause, and actually, on a number of the projects that I saw, some of them, the main problems with those biotope ponds were in places where they had a corner and they were getting no circulation and it was all the algae and the stuff that they didn't want was accumulating in that corner that was creating this dead zone that was then consuming the oxygen, making it all worse. Um, so I think that those systems, while very beautiful and also very expensive, they could even be enhanced upon. Yeah, can't, can't the corners be mitigated with sandbags or rocks? Oh, or and just using different construction materials. You can even build concrete in a nice round way, but it's more difficult. It takes more skill, mm -hmm. and so that's why you don't see it. Okay. People are used to doing what they're doing, and nice straight corners is mm -hmm. the quickest, easiest way for most people. Thanks. And so <laughs> crawfish, you know, the European crawfish, is oh. they get really big. Um, and they're really marketable. They're basically like a mini lobster. There's, they're really hard to cultivate because the American crawfish has invaded over there and is basically eating all of its food supply. And because it's smaller, it can survive on less food when shortages happen. And so in a degraded ecosystem, it has an advantage. They're so high up in the mountains that they can still grow the European crawfish. And so in any given year, you know, they have a lot of animals. They have, last time I was there, they had about 100 sheep, maybe 30 or 40 pigs, probably 40 cattle, maybe 100 chickens, guinea hens, all sorts of different stuff, ducks, geese. And in any given year, these crawfish will be 50% of their revenues from the animal operation of the farm, <laughs> including the fish, including all the different animals. These crawfish are one of their main marketable crops. And they're also really nice because they're a detritivore. So they're cycling all the different nutrients that are otherwise going to be hard to accumulate in the pond system. And then with the monk system, they have a really easy way of harvesting this, where 
on most of their ponds. They always have an overland emergency spillway as well, but they have a monk pipe, which is basically a stand pipe. The pipe goes through the dam, you get an elbow on it, you rip this gasket out so you can rotate it, and then you can set your water level by where you rotate that pipe to. And in any given point, if you drain the pond down to its deep zone, so all the flat zones are out in the open, about one third of the crawfish are going to be out and running around, about one third are going to stay in their burrows for a couple of days, and then one third are going to stay in their burrows till the water comes back. So you can basically drain the system, harvest everything in sight, and you still have two thirds of the population left, so it recharges very quickly. How do you create a great environment for them? This is where the texture and the habitat comes in. So you want to give them lots of areas to hide out in, you want to give lots of things, whether it's logs or rock piles, for different algae to be growing on. Uh, and then it's, it's about really just enhancing how many connections you can have. And so these flat zones are the areas where these guys are living. And so having some ponds that are entirely flat zones or having other ones with big flat zone systems, you can skew the water landscape that you're creating based on what you're trying to produce as the end result of it. Now another thing, when you're draining that system down to the deep zone, it's also a really good time to harvest the fish as well because you have them all accumulated <coughs> into a small <coughs> area. So if you want to come through and net out a bunch of fish, that's the time because it's really easy. <coughs> all the flat zones where you have all those logs and sticks and branches <coughs> and stuff that you'd get tied up in are all dry <coughs> so you can get right down to the deep zone. Um, and that's a really important, you know, it also skims stuff off the surface. It's a really nice control valve to be able to set the level of the water that you want, to be able to drain the water, to be able to work on the pond. You can also do certain things to either, you can actually use them to transfer fish into other ponds. So, and I've done it plenty where you just basically pitch the monk and then enough fish get sucked up down into the lower ponds. And then you can also make certain contraptions so that the fish can't travel. If you're trying to have a specific nursery where you do another pipe around the monk pipe, you can also use it to heat up or cool off the water. And so if you think normally set up, it's just taking the water off the top. So it's kind of a cooling valve and it's also vortexing that water. So adding the highest amount of oxygen you can right at the beginning of the float zone and then further oxygenating it as it comes down. But then if you want to raise the temperature of the water, you do another pipe around that with holes and slits at the bottom. So you're actually pulling water from the bottom of the pond up and down into the next one. Now you could also use that if you wanted to cool the pond downstream of it. So there's lots of different ways that you can maneuver this system to accomplish different things. Whether you want to heat up, cool down the water, keep stuff in, move stuff around. Um, it's a really nice control valve to have as part of a water system. How do you spell that? Monk, M-O-N-K. Oh, Monk. Yep. Another really important thing about the what they've done there is you're, in any given year, you're growing a lot of crops that take very minimal effort. Once they're established, maybe takes no effort, mm -hmm. but you're harvesting the things that did specifically well that year. So these numbers aren't accurate, but maybe they grow 100 crops every year and they harvest 20 to 30 of the ones that did the best that year, of the ones that fetched the best price at market. And so now you're buffered against all the different climate situations you could run into. Whether it's too hot or too cold or too dry or too wet, now it's not too hot or too cold, it's nice and hot or it's nice and cold or it's nice and wet or it's nice and dry. So here's an area where they have cherries and then they have mushroom logs growing in the shade of the cherries. And so in any given year, say it's a really dry year, the cherries are going to be an exceptional quality for schnapps. The mushrooms may not be fruiting at all or fruiting so little that it's not even really worth harvesting. So they put all their time and energy into harvesting the cherries and don't even bother with the mushrooms. Now in a really wet year, all the cherries are going to be splitting and molding. So the cherries are just the birds that year. It's not even worth harvesting. The mushrooms are having a bumper crop. So you put all your time and energy into the mushrooms. You can also let the market conditions that year. Maybe mushrooms, there's a big flush in the market. So the prices are so low. Because the main challenge with these systems, growing and productivity is the easy part. Harvesting is the labor intensive part. That's why monoculture is so 
common. You can drive one tractor with a combine over 100 acres and turn that into money that day. You can do 1,000 acres that day. Whereas these systems, the harvesting is really all of the time. And so you want to make sure that you're maximizing that input. You're not harvesting something that's not going to end up giving you money when you factor in the time it took to harvest. Um, so if you can get the system going, granted that takes time, but you get these crops that are producing, you know, the Swiss cone pines, for example, is a very nice marketable nut pine. It also produces a lot of really good fragrant jams and jellies. <coughs> Once they're going, they're producing every year. You don't do anything. You're just working on the harvest. And so in a bumper year, that's something you really put your time into harvesting. If they have a really bad year, you put your time into harvesting something else. And now instead of the modern farmer who's always complaining that it hasn't rained or it's rained too much, now that's all a benefit because all the different conditions that can happen, something's having a bumper year. Something's gaining from that drought or from that flood. Uh, so it enables you to have a much more positive relationship with the climate and with nature. And then animals are a really nice way. They basically have animals as a harvesting mechanism where a lot of these different crops that don't get harvested every year, they bring through the pigs and harvest all the windfall or they bring through the cows or all the different things. They have these really nice earth stables all over the place using the ground temperature so that it's nice and warm in the winter. It's nice cool in the summer. He likes them to face east so that the animals get up and go to work in the morning. Um, <laughs> and then you're also preventing that late day sun, the western sun, that's going to get really hot in the summer. So animals are really can be a harvesting mechanism. And the way that I look at animals, there's so much work. If they're not working for you, it's too much work in my opinion. So if an animal is providing a function, if a pig is your tiller, great. That's totally worth all the time you're going to use fencing and things like that. But if you're just having a pig to have a pig, <coughs> that's a lot of work. You really want your animals to be actively working for you. Otherwise, you're just working for them. This is a really nice cellar that septed uh, all out of stone. It's a nice dome structure. And so in a really cold climate, food storage becomes really important. You get a lot of sun in the summer. You get a lot of productivity in the summer. How do you catch and store that energy and provide it to yourself throughout the year? And so these earth cellars are a really great way to do that. They used to cut ice from some of the ponds and bring it in here, and they could keep ice into the end of July, start of August in this cellar by basically cutting ice blocks, putting straw all around them, and so they can keep stuff really cold, they can keep stuff kind of cool, and they have these different cellars all throughout the place that hold different temperatures for storage of the different crops. Does that matter which direction they are facing? Uh, usually they're facing east as well. Um, they, but that really shifts with climate as well. Mm -hmm. You know, in some climates, you really just want that north facing. In some climates, you might even want it south facing so that it gets enough sun in the winter so that you can get in through the snow. Um, <coughs> but for the most part, they're doing eastern facing stuff. What was the climate where this cellar held eyes till July? This is at the Kremlin Hof. Oh. Um, yeah, these are all, I'll tell you when we switch to the next project, but all these pictures are from the Kremlin Hof. No. <laughs> And then they do, this is their herb garden, you know, they have medicines, they have all sorts of things all over the place, all these diversified crops all mixed together, which is perfect for a family homestead, but then also when you look at it and you really get diligent about choosing what you're going to harvest each year, it's really effective for a production farm as well. So that's something to really consider. Uh, and, you know, it's just, it's a beautiful landscape. People that go there are just blown away and you're walking around and you're basically on this mountainside, but it's like the Garden of Eden up there. There's food all over the place and it's a system that is really going to continue to thrive even if there's no human intervention for the next hundred years. This place is going to be growing all sorts of food for wildlife and animals and it's going to be a productive ecosystem with no one doing anything to it, although it would look significantly different. So there's the, the rocks are used as heat sinks in both the water features and the land features. And so you're, if you think of it like a passive solar house, you have a collection surface and then you have your insulation around it. So you leave your collection surface open to your sun and then you're trying to store and trap that 
<coughs> temperature all in the earth all around. So a lot of these rocks, you know, the southern faces are exposed, and then it's, you know, about three quarters buried into the earth. So that's that's a technique, right? That's yep. not just a buildup of soil. No, no, that's anything. a technique. Okay. Yep. And then also in the water, there will be a collection surface exposed than most of the rock underwater so that that stone is acting as basically a heat conduit between the sun and the water. And if you see a nice water feature where there are big stones, go out and step on the stone and just sit there long enough for everything to go back to normal and you'll see that's where all the little fish hang out, that's where all the crustaceans hang out, that's where the water is warmest so on a nice sunny day <coughs> around those rocks is where the life is really happening. Um. So how, what does it look like subsurface right there? Um, Are those rocks charging more? So up? it's, no, nope. Um, a lot of times, you know, the rocks, let's say the sun is coming from here. The rocks set like this and it's buried into the soil like that. Okay. And so you've got your collection surface, which is then diffusing that heat all around. And then that earth is also the insulation around it. So it's keeping that heat longer throughout the night. Whereas if you just had that stone exposed out, it's going to heat up and cool off a lot quicker. Whereas this is using it more like a, a thermal battery so that you're exposing your collection surface, but you're insulating everything around. What is the rock like there on the Kremeter Hoss? What, what is the, the material? The bay, you know, I actually don't know the major forming material, but it's a lot of big, a lot of big boulders. Um, it yeah, I don't know. Light colored. Would, would it? Is it okay if they're darker? Oh yeah, but even as far as a heat sink, even better if they're darker. What if you painted them darker? <laughs> you could. I wouldn't. I like to use all natural materials, um, so I don't introduce any. Smoke them. Yeah, you. I. You could char them definitely. Charm, yeah. Um, yeah, that may work. I don't see why not. Okay. It always comes down to the question. Could you do it? Yes. Yeah. Would you do it? Yeah. No. And is it worth doing? Because really, this functions really well even without the painting. Even if they're pretty light colored rock, go out and feel a rock even if it's light colored. If it's been in the sun, it's nice and warm. Um, if you had a choice between light and dark colored rocks, should you choose the darker? Probably yeah, 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 it depends on where you are. are you yeah, if you're in a really cold place, yeah, darker would be better. Pennsylvania. Um, yeah. I, there you could use the either and you'd be quite nice because you're a pretty moderate climate. So while I was over in Europe, I was able to visit Sepp's project that I actually, in my opinion, is his most impressive project. It's a project he did for Princess Nora von Liechtenstein in the Extremadura, which is... Uh, one of the harsher climates out there, you know, it's not like the Sahara. It, it gets substantial rainfall, but it's a seasonal thing. And in the summers, it's about 115 degrees, and it's 30 mile per hour blowing hot winds. And so this is a landscape that's, <laughs> when it gets warm, it's warm and oppressively so, and really desiccating, just trying to draw all that moisture away. And so this is a project, this lake has yet to be built and may not be at this point, uh, but where I believe over two years, Sepp came in and did si 16 different ponds and lakes in a place that people thought it was crazy. They said, there's no way you can build all these water features here. The soil's all sandy. <coughs> you know, he had so many different problems where all these people didn't believe it would be possible. They said, oh, you're going to lose all the water to evaporation. You're going to have salt build up in the water because of evaporation. All these different issues where the theory cripples were saying, this isn't going to work, that isn't going to work. The princess basically believed in him anyway, and they went ahead and did it. And man, it's the most incredible place I've been. It's in a, in a landscape where all of these oaks were dying. They had all this different disease trouble. And same thing, they were trying to treat the symptoms instead of the disease. So they were actually injecting all the trees a couple of times a year with this thing that was supposed to make them resistant to the um, fungal infection that was happening. They actually thought it was a virus. And so they were injecting the trees with this thing that was supposed to help with the virus at huge expense, I think like 10 euro per injection for thousands of trees. 
And so Zepp came there and analyzed the situation. And again, they were trying to treat the symptom, these trees are dying, rather than the root of the disease, which was the stress, which was this heavily overgrazed landscape, desertifying, where all around the tree roots was barren. And so they dug up some of the trees and Sep basically said, you know, the disease isn't in the trees, the disease is in your head. And um, oh. <laughs> <laughs> so they created this beautiful landscape that's, you know, just incredible. There's waterfowl all over the place. <laughs> now this is the largest ecological point of interest in Europe. And it's just, the you know, this is the vestige of some of the cork oak or some of the oaks still did <coughs> die. And a lot of them actually were swamped out by the water retention features, but the other ones are really coming back strong and healthy. And so some of them were too far gone to recoup, but a lot of them, most of them have actually come back strong and new ones are growing. And it's, it's just a beautiful, incredible landscape. And they really had a lot of points where they very carefully sorted the material. And so material is a really important thing and water actually sorts material over time. The water, as it starts to lose energy, first it drops the gravel, then it drops the sand, then it drops the silt, and then it drops the clay last, once it's gotten flat, because clay is actually fully dispersed into water and then reconstituted in a plated crystalline structure. And so even in, I don't even look at the NRCS soil survey stuff, it's so inaccurate and it's so broad scope and it's based all on what's on the surface, when deep down you oftentimes have all these different layers and these different geologies that have built up over time. And so this was an area where people thought he was crazy, there's nothing but sand, but in the right places in the landscape, there was plenty of the earthen materials to create these small earthworks that create a really large water body that stores that seasonal water and not just seasonal water, but year to year, like we were saying before. So were these clay lines that they were finding sources of clay and clay lining or just picking <laughs> spots? Uh, well, they're, they're, so that brings up a really good, um, actually leads right into my next topic where these are a specific type of pond where it's not actually, you know, they're only doing the work in the dam itself. And so what you have is... In the earth, you're going to have all this different layering. And we're just going to draw out a sample layer here. Um, so we've got our topsoil here. We've got, let's say, some, uh, let's say some clay subsoil here. And then we've got this band of sand and gravel. And then we've got a tight clay layer down here. And so the difference between this clay layer and this one is that this one is not water impermeable. And so what's happening on the higher parts of this landscape is the water is coming down. It's, you know, it's moving this way, it's moving this way, infiltrating. It's eventually hitting this hard clay layer and then from that point forward, it's traveling on top of that hard clay layer. And so what you're doing is you're identifying this geology in key points, and it can be all sorts of different forms of this, but where you're basically then doing a, a spare sheets, a barrier layer, tied into this clay layer. And so what you're doing is you're digging your trench down. Maybe this clay is, can be mixed into a higher concentration, basically sorting as it's being pulled out through different piling techniques where you can actually concentrate the clay in it. And so what you're doing is you're pulling this back, sorting this clay, and then actually using this clay to pack your barrier layer. So you're building this all the way back up to grade, and then you're building your dam on top of that. And so this is all 40% plus clay at the right moisture content, compacted enough so that it's not allowing any water to pass. This doesn't need to be impermeable. This doesn't need to be impermeable. It can be, great if it is, but if you're limited on clay, you really only need this middle area. And you're keying this into that clay layer, 
And so now what you're doing with this pond, you're not just catching the surface runoff. You're catching this, which is the really big important part. You're catching this subsurface flow that now everywhere up on the landscape, it's infiltrating into here, it's coming into here, it's hitting this wall, and then it's starting to fill up. And so you're not just storing the water in the basin itself, but you're storing the water in the landscape uphill of the basin. So here's a really good example where your dam is here, this is your water body, and then this is, see this whole green spectrum? <coughs> That's all of the soil where because of this type of dam, you're not just creating a clay basin pond, you're creating a dam tied into that natural clay layer. So now you're not just storing the water in the pond itself, but you're storing the water in this topsoil, in this clay layer, in this sand layer. And so what's really important, you know, you see all this area that's really green way uphill of the pond. And so now you're not, you're really mitigating your evaporative losses as well. Because say you lose an inch to evaporation on the pond, but if the pond is just half of your total water retention, and a lot of it is actually in the earth's body uphill, you're really only losing a half inch because it's recharging. And the other thing is because this isn't just a basin lined pond, you're also actually getting infiltration from the landscape over time. So you can have a situation where you have, let's say up here, you have a terraced and treed landscape. You could have water flowing into your pond three months after the last rain because you're catching this layer. And so that's a really important part of these type of water retention landscapes. Um, and so this is, you know, it's, it's just a beautiful place. Here's one of the earth cellars that Sep built. Uh, it's right now, I would say it's, it's not, they, they farm a few things, but it's really more of an ecological center where they're more interested in promoting the different wildlife, observing the different li wildlife, providing tours for people to learn and expand from that, and also really providing a demonstration. And it's just a beautiful place. You know, this is a stork living right above the house. There's a donkey hanging out in the carport. Um, and this was one of my favorite features. So in the vestige of these dying oaks, one of the ones that got flooded, there's a crane that has its nest that then a bunch of sparrows made their nest under the crane. And it just, the whole time walking through here, my smile was just ear to ear. It just was so vibrant in a landscape that's so water scarce and water limited. And actually, it was interesting. They've had a really dry year, a really dry couple of years the big reservoir that's quite close to this, which is people struggle understanding the difference between a reservoir and a pond, but really decentralized water retention is what's most important. You can't <coughs> just channel it all to certain places and then hold it. It's a different system. I don't have time to go into it. But so the big reservoir was, I don't know, three, four meters down, a huge amount, you know, 15, 20 feet down, these water features were down, but not nearly as much because they're not just trying to store the water in the water feature itself, but it's storing it in the earth all around as well, which is a really important part, getting into that full water cycle instead of the half water cycle. Okay, question. Um, with a lot of these natural features and utilizing your drawing here, you know, there's a lot of people with artificial ponds and things in uh, farming, and they're always talking about cleaning out and dredging the ponds. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I would think that this that would be perfect. That just adds to it in this case, right? Yeah. Green yep. is actually beneficial. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. And I still, you know, I look at the sediment loading that you're going to get from a place and the potential for that, and I always create sediment traps. So instead of because every pond is moving towards a wetland. It's one of the fastest generators of soil on the planet, and it's also getting all the soil that's moving from anywhere uphill. You know, ideally you're not disturbing the <coughs> earth, you're creating forest polyculture systems, so you're not gonna have a lot of erosion, but there are plenty of situations where someone else is controlling your watershed, and they can till everything up or cut the forest down in one year, you're gonna have a huge amount of sediment flowing through. And so what I like to do 
is create sediment traps, basically areas that are really easy to dredge and harvest that sediment and use for gardens or roads or whatever based on the type of sediment that's being dropped there. And then your larger water features that you're creating don't really ever need to be dredged because you're handling the sediment before it enters or in a specific area of it where it's really easy to get a machine in. So you don't need one of those big pond dredging huge armed excavators that are super expensive, you can use normal equipment. You might even be able to use your own farm equipment and you can size the sediment trap to, you know, if you want to clean it out every five years, you size it one size. If you want to clean it out every 20 years, you do a different size. Um, so you still, I'm always building that into the system, but in deliberate places where it's going to be easy to manage. Whereas a lot of times, man, the stuff that pond builders do is just a disaster. I've seen pond builders where they create a pond in a valley and they're using a well to fill that pond. So they're basically pulling the blood out of the body and spraying it on the surface. And then they create a diversion ditch all the way around the pond so that none of the rainwater can enter it because they don't want the sediment entering the pond. And so now they've got this pond that was sited well, but is an ecological disaster because it's directly <laughs> moving all the sediment and rainfall away from the actual water feature. Oh man. And these are the ponds that cost three hundred thousand dollars, half a million dollars, a million dollars. It's it's insanity. Um, so now we're gonna cover a project that I did this last fall, just to show you more of the pictures through the process in Tennessee. Um, beautiful little place. Uh, basically something that's going to be set up as a family homestead, maybe a kind of ecotourism thing down the line. Uh, but so basically here in this valley, which is steeper than it looks right here, you would have never known unless if you knew how to read the landscape, but there is actually a spring subsurface here that some genius had decided to tap and then just drain down the hill because they wanted to be able to come through here. They wanted to dry up this wetland part, which is what people are doing everywhere. Wetlands are really hard to manage. There's nothing, you can't plant arable crops, you can't get your tractor through. There's all these different issues. So a lot of times you run into this situation where who knows how long ago, but really valuable vital water features have actually been specifically drained from the landscape so that people can drive their tractor through the bottom of this valley, for example. Um, so, the first thing that we did was figure out really where that spring was, what layers it was riding on, where it was moving through that clay layer, because that's where all the water from uphill is going to be coming through, and then figuring out the best way to optimize it. And so here is the water feature we ended up making. Um, the dam kind of comes through here more or less. And so you can see you're always looking for the places where you can do the least amount of earthwork moving for the most amount of water retention. This is a pretty tight, steep valley, lots of rocks, pretty temperamental geology, um, but we were still able to get a pretty nicely sited pond. This is putting in the key of the dam, and so digging down to that barrier clay layer that's down there, getting clay of the right composition and of the right moisture content, and basically building this trench up. Now, no pond is ever really the same. Each one is specific and unique. And so in this situation, you can see there was a lot of overburden to get to the good clay material that I basically started piling up for my downhill side of the dam before actually cutting this. Usually you cut that first and pack it with clay, but if you don't have the clay to do so, you got to expose the clay. And so if you have, you know, let's say instead more like what we had was something like this, where this was a gravelly crap layer, but is actually really nice and strong for stuff like this. So we set aside all the topsoil for the end of the project, piled it up uphill, because then it's nice and easy to move down. If you throw it downhill at the beginning, you're going to be kicking yourself when it's time to move it back uphill and spread it around. Then we stripped off all of that bad, poor subsoil that wasn't going to be usable for any type of watertight layer pull that here for the time being um, to build the downhill side of the embankment. And then we were able to harvest this clay, get it to the right moisture content, and then start packing it into the clay here. And so what you see here is... So it was the first initial clay layer that you were after? 
It was the first. Uh, like in the prior example, you had two different clay layers. Yep. Um, so you were after the first clay layer, or a clay layer that yeah. was right below the yep. table. Okay. And it's always, it's always very different. Sometimes you're using this clay layer to pack this and digging out your deep zone as part of the process. Sometimes you have your clay layers up other areas. It's always, it's always a really dynamic thinking process when it comes time to do these projects because you got to really carefully sort your materials. And man, excavator operators hate me because <laughs> I'm watching them like a hawk. And most of the time I just, at this point, do it myself because it's easier to do myself than explain to someone because it's very delicately, you know, I don't want any sand mixed in with that clay layer. I don't want any subsoil mixed in with that topsoil. So it's, it's a very deliberate, delicate, simple and logical, but precise, very precise. And you have to be thinking during the process. Um, I'll just move uh, this way. Good moisture content. For the clay. Good moisture content is when you can take it in your hand and you can ball it up, and it no moisture squeezes out, but it keeps and holds its form. It's a little bit drier than you'd think, but the best way to figure that out is with model building, which is what we'll be doing in the next section, because it's different with every material. You're looking for a different moisture content. And then if you want to get really specific, you can get a geotechnical engineer involved and they'll tell you, okay, this needs this percentage water and they'll actually come out with, they call it a nuke, but they basically, as you're building this up, they'll come out and they'll beat this iron rod into it and then they stick a little tube of uranium in it and shoot it out and basically can tell, you know, how compacted it is, if it's compacted enough, all those different details. So for certain projects where you know litigation is going to be an issue, it's good to do that beforehand. So, you know, they're pretty cheap to hire a couple hundred, couple thousand dollars. Um, and it's well worth it to be able to, when problems do come up, you can say, okay, well, here's the spec sheet. And all of this was done to civil engineering specs. So... And do you always um, insist on getting a soil sample so that there's no surprises when you go down? Y yes, and there's always surprises when I go down still. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. it's, you know, it's constantly moving around. Like here, you get into all these rocky crap layers. And so it's, I, I tell people if the earthworks that I do look like the design that I made, I screwed up. It should not look exactly like the design. We should be changing the design based on what we find. Every console, I'll do test slices. Yep. So we get a good idea, but you can Swiss cheese a whole property and still end up with surprises mm -hmm. as you get into the areas and as you really open up areas. So that's a big part. Any project that I'm gonna do, I need to be there on site, do test slices, see what geology we're working with to basically say, okay, we can build a pond here or we can't, or it's going to cost too much or the different variables that could come into play. Um, but then you still end up with surprises always. They're just smaller surprises. You have a general idea of what you're going to do, how long it should take, what equipment you need, all of those kinds of things. I just, I was on a big project, or well, I was visiting a farm on a project with a, a um, practicum with David Holmgren and Darren Doherty, uh -huh. and they're putting in a series of like, huge dams and there was one at the house and um, it, it turned out that no one had done the done the core samples to actually have a look uh -huh. and Darren nearly stopped the project right there because it was all supposed to have been organized and, uh, okay yeah, yeah, and yeah he's yeah. like he doesn't do any work without yeah. first getting some some samples some yeah slices. yeah okay. definitely and for me too it's important you know I'm not even really concerned with what's up here you know, I want to know what's down here. And so for test slices, you know, sometimes you can dig in a few feet and know enough. Other times you got to dig down 6, 8, 10, 12, 20 feet to figure out your different layering. And then there comes the question, you know, if this clay layer is 20 feet down, how much water are you retaining? Is it worth the cost to build a dam keyed into that? Um, and I really... Only in specific situations do I ever build a pond that's not this system. Because in my opinion, this is the most ecological, best bang for your buck. You know, sometimes you are doing a basin clay pond. If you have to do a liner, my opinion is that you shouldn't be building a pond there. Um, even the bentonite liners, you know, I just don't trust stuff like that. But also the big reason for getting into this work 
is that before I was doing this, I did a lot of work with greenhouses and it was very nice, but there was so much high energy material from the metal to the plastic to the wood to the concrete, blah, 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 blah. This stuff I really like because it's a little bit of diesel. It's some plastic pipes every once in a while. But other than that, it's just rearranging the earthen materials in the way that is going to be able to meet your goals and maximize what you have in a property. And your clay line, if you've got a band of clay, a band of gravel, then you'll be clay lining that so that it's not coming out round, like wicking out round the dam walls. Yeah, so you, you know, you're going to... The, the most critical part, if we're looking at kind of a contour overhead, the most critical part is where this dam is going to tie into these corners and making sure that there aren't areas. I'm not so concerned about water lines that are coming around here yeah. that are going to rehydrate old springs or stuff like that. Yeah, I'm fine with that. You want to put the water back into the landscape but you also want to hold enough water for your uses and your intended goals of the project. And so these two areas are always the most difficult parts because you're basically, if you're looking at a profile view, you're trying to find a clay layer in a valley that looks like that. So, you know, the surface layers might be like this. And so you're tying your dam into these clay layers and across like that. And it's a clay dam. It's a clay dam. The core of it, the barrier layer is clay. This, not necessarily, can be. This, not necessarily, can be. If you're building the whole thing with clay, that brings in some other considerations, and you may actually, you're going to need different batters, or you may actually want to mix some material in for this and this, so that it's, because clay has really high expansion and contraction. Um, so it's, it's a lot of different variables, too much to cover right now, but the easiest thing is just build your own models. Build your models with the material you're working with on site. Figure out, you know, okay, I'm working with this clay at this time of year. Dig it out. See if you think you need to add water to it. If you don't, do five different models. One with no water, one with a bunch of water, one with a little water, and then simulate your rainfall events. See what happens. Do something and something happens. The easiest way to learn is by small experiments and failures. Failures are very important to learning and you can get so tied up in theory that's not necessarily coming from a point of practice um, that, <coughs> yeah, it's, I, I think all questions can be answered with nature and with the model, whereas there's so many different details that you'd have to cover in theory that I think it's impossible to really get a good idea for. If you can't get enough clay from your site, is it appropriate to bring in clay? Depends on how much and where and... Uh, uh, I try and avoid it as much as possible. I have run into that, definitely. And I have brought in clay, and sometimes I've wondered if it was really the best thing. Um, you know, it's, it's a mix of context. How badly do you need the water? How much money does the client have? Uh, you know, is the clay that you're going to bring in actually going to deliver a measurable result? And usually, if you're scrapped for clay there's a better pond location, or a pond may not be the real best way to manage water in that situation. No. What I'm going to continue with is a project that I did in Tennessee. So as I was mentioning, this is, this is putting in that barrier layer. So attaching to... It's actually interesting because in this case, the spring was actually riding on another clay layer that was on top of this barrier clay layer that I wanted to tie the dam into. So do you have to do this kind of thing in a dry season or can you do it every season? That's a great question. Well, that's the question of my life. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's basically there is a time of year, there may be several, where that clay is already at a good moisture holding capacity to be compacted. So in each of these projects there's a time window. It could be a couple of months, it could be half a season, it could be a couple of weeks when you're going to hit the clay being at the right moisture content, which is when you want to move on the project. You can do it in a variety of moistures, but it's really, it can be a lot more work. And I'd much rather a material that's too dry, it's pretty easy to get a fire truck in, wet it down to the right moisture content, and compact it. A material that's too wet, could double the price of a project. So there, you know, you can do them in a lot of different seasons, but there's going to be 
a time f window for each project in each context where it makes the most sense, where the clay is closest to the right moisture content, where the season is closest to the right, so that the right things that you want are happening afterwards. Um, so in this kind of climate, for example, the spring is going to be too wet, and it's going to depend on where you are in the landscape. If you're in an area where there's an underground spring, you know, obviously that's going to be a different situation than if you're in an area that's bone dry. This project in Tennessee, because it rains so much, we did this one in August, and really that end of July through September is the time frame to be doing, or I know it was actually September that we did this one, and it's really the August, September, beginning of October is the best time window when that clay is dry enough to work with. Uh, if we were to try and do this in the spring, it would have been a whole different level of work where now you need to pull out the clay, you need to let it dehydrate. Sometimes you're actually rolling it with the excavator tracks to squeegee the moisture out, basically. And it, it just gets to the point where I don't do projects like that because it's just wasting people's money. So instead, let's just plan on the right time of year. That's where the test slices come in as well. I'm not just looking for the geologies that we're working with, but the moisture content of the material as we go down so that we can say, okay, it's too wet this time of year, we should do it now or in the future, or it's too dry and we need to do this a couple months earlier. So you get a good idea for that. So a very important point actually. Um, and so in this situation, that spring that you saw was riding on a different clay layer and then there was this really nice, hard, impermeable clay layer that I wanted to tie the dam into so that you're catching not just that one spring, but any other subsurface flow from farther uphill that's working in those permeable layers down deeper. So we actually stripped off the one clay layer to use as the barrier layer to tie into this um, deeper down mother clay layer that was very hard. So hard to the point where it was actually difficult to dig through with the excavator. So you get a good feeling for the different layers as you're digging and moving through them. And so this is, you know, this is, this is all of that overburden I was talking about. This is the middle of that dam building it up. This is when we're to just a little bit above grade now, continuing to, it's also important you can only compact it in rises. You can't just fill up the material and compact it because then you're just compacting the top. So you really, and it changes based on the material, but you're doing anywhere from 20 to 50 centimeters at a time, maybe even 10 centimeters, depending on your material that you're using, the equipment you're using for compaction, the moisture content, all of those different variables. When you're building this and you are layering, are you having some uh, <coughs> somebody test for compaction and soil density? I, I'm testing for that okay. um, with my feet and with something that I'm... So certain projects, I'll bring in a geotechnical engineer to do a really thorough assessment. Other ones where I always present that as an option to the client. If they want that paper trail to say if they ever have any problems, here's how we did it, here's, it's all up to specs, go screw yourself, basically. <laughs> um, but other projects where you're not concerned about that, it's cheaper to not do that. So it's based on what the person wants. Okay. I try and always articulate all the options and then let the client decide which route they want to go. If I understood correctly, you went past one layer of clay. Mm -hmm. uh, going down, how do you know which one is the impermeable layer of clay? Well, so the, the first one was an impermeable layer, and then there was another gravel band that was rounded gravel, so indicating water flow at times. And so I wanted to make sure to capture that water as well. Um, you know, that's a hard question to answer. It's You can test if a layer is impermeable by digging into it and then doing a percolation test, dumping a bunch of water in it and seeing does it hold, does it diffuse, what happens. You can also test the material with like a mason jar shake test, see how much clay is in it. You also get a good feel for it as you're digging through it. How hard is it? Is it like a soft clay loam that's not really gonna hold up to heavy pressure of the water? Or is it usually when you find those barrier clay layers, you can see that it's such because there's either water running on top of it, which is a great indicating sign, or it's actually so hard and firm that it gets harder for the machine to dig through. Um, so in this case, 
the top clay layer was pretty soft. It was a really high uh, concentration of clay, really high percentage of clay. It was at a good moisture content, but you know, I always, you want to see not just the top of that clay layer, but how deep it is or an idea of if it's deep enough. And so then once we punched through to a gravel layer, I wanted to see what was under that. And then once we hit a layer that was actually hard for a 23 ton excavator to dig through, I knew, okay, that's the layer we want to tie it into. And you checked the there whether or not they're a dispersive clay. Um, I didn't actually. I can. Um, okay. Yeah, I, I mean, I built a model, and so I guess that would be yeah. checking in a certain way. <laughs> um, but that's actually something I'd like to know more about, dispersive clays versus non-dispersive. And how do you check for that? Oh, the simple way is you just form a clump of it, put it in a, in a jar, and a dispersive clay, the, 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 the piece of clay will tend to um, it'll soften out and flatten Okay. And over time, cover. Yeah. So that its reaction to water is that it, it will—it's still a clay, but yeah. it will tend to spread out, soften, which is problematic. Yeah. Whereas, a, yeah. you know, a normal clay, you drop it in, and it will, will retain its shape within the jar and not move. Okay. I think it's the yeah. Ad yeah. Adenberg test or something like okay. that. Okay. Yeah. And then another thing with these kind of dams is that your, you know, your clay isn't really in the pond itself; it's in that barrier layer which is trapped in between these two big embankments. So it also helps because it's not, you know, it would have to first disperse into the soil to then be able to disperse into the water. Yeah. And it also really helps with expansion and contraction because instead of a clay basin that once you make it, if it's dry for a month, you're going to get cracks forming and stuff like that, you're hydrating your clay, but it's trapped inside earth. So you need a really severe event to really start dehydrating that because it's under a meter of earth in all directions basically um and so this is this is that spring you know eventually we ended up doing just a real rough casing in this area but i think it's also important you know what i'm trying to do with my work is enhance the relationship between people and their landscape and so it's really important to have nice little artful flares and so in this place, it was on a road called Stony Fork. We had boulders just like crazy. And so you can make nice areas like this diving rock where right below it is six feet deep. Out a little bit is like eight. Then you get into 10, 12 feet deep. So because we had these big tab loans to work with, we can make all these nice features. Um, also another, you'll see this rock later on stood upright, defines that sediment trap that you'll see in the in a couple more slides. And so this is that diving rock, uh, a nice big stone patio, and then these are those boulders. So there's another pond up here that's also a sediment trap that's really the primary sediment trap that's a little hot pond with a monk on it. So you can basically, if you want to drain the sediment or dredge the sediment, you can actually drain the pond and get in there real easy and harvest it out. And then there's also another one where this flat zone of this pond is also the sediment trap. So that if you need to, if there's so much that it starts to really overflow that first pond, you have another good area to harvest it out. And then those rocks also form a barrier that makes the larger fish feel more exposed when they come into that area because they're going to be more susceptible to predation from birds and things like that. So it helps give an added layer of protection for the smaller smaller food items along the ecosystem. How do you harvest the sediment without also harvesting frogs and tadpoles and such? You're going to be harvesting those guys too. I, draining it is one way um, beforehand. How do you get it out? Uh, you're pulling it out with a machine. So oh. you're, yeah, you're going to be, you're going to be pulling out a little bit of everyone with it, okay. um, which, yeah, it's, it's part of the can you suction it out, siphon it out? They do have these uh, rather expensive sediment pumps where they actually kind of stir the sediment up into the water and pump it out. Um, but I, I had a project where we were looking at doing that, but then they ultimately determined that it was too expensive. And that's going to suck out all the stuff with it as well, all the living organisms. So um, usually by machine is what you're doing it with. So did that, that dam mainly fill from the spring or from runoff? Uh, that's a great question. So the spring is four gallons an 
hour. So very low flow. Um, and basically it, it was slowly filling up, but then once they get a big rainfall event, filled up. Um, one bit, you know, they had a, in Tennessee, they had a really long drought in the whole Southeast, a bunch of forest fire issues. And then they just had like a two inch rainfall just, mm -hmm. and so at that point filled right up. Yeah. Um, and so spillways are another really important thing. What I like to do with my ponds, it's just an extra. So the freeboard is the level between the water surface mm -hmm. and the height of the dam. And then you have your spillway. If you have a monk, you're always going to have an emergency overland spillway that's sized for, I don't just size them for the 100 year event, I size them for the 1000 year event because we're moving into more uncertain weather events. And if I make an earthwork, I want something that's going to hopefully last until the next ice age. Um, so a really oversized spillway that's going to be able to handle any amount of water moving through there that gets wider as it comes across. Then the other thing I like to do is actually have this whole terrace around the pond below the height of my dam. So if the spillway is totally overwhelmed, it has to then flood this whole terrace all the way around the dam before it can ever potentially breach the dam. So you're, you've got a few different fail safes. You know, you've got the monk system for your first valve, you've got the overland spillway for your backup, which should be built for the thousand year flooding event. And then if anything really crazy happens, like Noah's flood, you have this terrace around that's going to flood the whole terrace, which isn't really designed to be a wetland, but it's designed to be a catastrophic shock absorber. Do you ever, um, do you ever uh, put the, as a strategy, depending on where you are, put the spillway not on the dam wall, but off so that if it does ever get overwhelmed and cuts, it's only going to cut the spillway and you're only going to lose <coughs> part of your dam? Yeah, 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 absolutely. And another really important point that, that brings up is the spillway should always be on undisturbed ground. So it's not on ground mm. that you packed in place. So this is, our dam is basically here. And this is actually off into the side of the dam on earth that we never molested. It never was changed. It was settled by nature. And so that's, you can never settle things as well as nature did. And so having that spillway run on undisturbed ground as far away from the dam as possible. Um, here, we basically, this is ledge a little bit into there, so we could only move it over so far, uh, but we got it as far away from the dam as possible, and that's a really important point. Where would the monk pipe be located? So there, there isn't a monk on this bottom yeah. pond, but usually it would be uh, somewhere along this dam okay. wall. You'll see with the other pond, you have a little <coughs> dock out to the monk so that you can control it. Where's um, the dam? This is the dam. Spillways, that's just next to the dam. Yep. In this one. Yep. Yep. But you don't want it. Uh, well, this is so. This is off of the earth that we were disturbing. You know, this is really that key and dam, and this was an area that we cut down, and so it's it's <coughs> a little bit deceiving because this was all dug out, but this was part of the natural hillside. So as far you know, you would never want it. That would be the worst place mm -hmm. for a spillway. Um, you really want it away from that dam as much as possible and on natural undisturbed ground. I don't know if you're going to go into the construction, but do you tamp it when you get to that clay layer to seal it up and you can put pigs in there? To for, for which? For the pond? For, so for the spillway? Have, yeah, well the pond. So you have uh -huh. a spring in the center and you mm -hmm. don't want to tamp that down. Mm -hmm. I'm sure it just yep. keep coming, but you would tamp down the remaining clay when you hit that clay layer? And well, you so seal it up or you put pigs in there? That's where, you know, with, with these kind of ponds, you have that barrier clay layer. You have your, you know, this is great. This is the level of the earth. This is that clay layer. You're building your dam tied into that clay layer. So I'm doing nothing to seal any of this. Yeah. It's a leaky okay. dam. Yeah. It's a hydro okay. dam. Yeah, well, exactly. Well, you want that subsurface for everything else to be recharged anyway. Exactly. So Exa and this only works if this layer is impermeable mm -hmm. and if it's the right shape and the right kind of valley. But then you get into that situation where you're not just storing the water in the pond itself, you're storing the water in the landscape all around the pond, which really these water retention landscapes, 
aquaculture is great. There's lots of things you can do with it, but it's really in these systems is more about the ecology that you're creating around the water, the different hydration zones around the water, having access to water. And so it's you're not you're building these almost more for the areas around them than for the pond itself. Block pipes? Um, so the, um, you know, that monk would be, let's say we've got our pond that ends up shaped something like that. Um, and it actually come down deeper, but that's neither here nor now, right now. So you might have your monk going through here and then your stand pipe, your little dock out to it so that you can actually swivel mm -hmm. that pipe. And then, um, so this is kind of replacing what, it's a different type of a lock pipe. Um, it's a lock pipe that gives you more control over the surface. Um, and because it's a vertical pipe instead of horizontal, you know, all sorts of branches and leaves and stuff can build up here. Anything that can get over there and into it, it's gonna spit right out anything that might clog up the pipe system is not going to make it in there in the first place. It's going to get, you know, if you have a big log sitting in the soil, it's not going to be able to get down in there. Um, and then as far as a lot of people do baffle plates, yep. uh, which I actually really try and avoid because of my training with that, you know, water has such a tiny head. It can work its way through so many different things. And when you have a lot of pressure on it, what will happen if you have no baffle plate is eventually this is a smooth surface. Eventually, if water can work its way all through here, once it starts flowing out here, you get this spiraling siphon. It starts dumping out a lot of sediment pretty quickly, and then you have a landslide flood. It's a really catastrophic event. So what a lot of people do to mitigate that is they put in a baffle plate. I don't really like that technique. I, it's better than nothing, definitely. But now what you have is that water, it takes longer, but it can still potentially work around that baffle plate. It's gonna be a lot harder. You know, if this, let's say this is a really big dam, we just put the smooth pipe in, you know, maybe it blows out in 20 years. <coughs> now if you put a baffle plate in, maybe it blows out in 100 years. Uh, what ZEP does and what I do as well is you basically, you take this pipe, and you paint it with blitz cement, wrap it with geotextile, and paint that with blitz cement so that what you get is that this pipe is a variegated, structured, it's not a smooth surface. And so now instead of one place where you're really stopping the flow of water, and this is all hand-tamped clay, so now the water has to move through all these different areas to actually get through there, um, and it's a pretty simple, pretty cheap, pretty straightforward way to do it. I find that it's usually cheaper than a baffle plate. Mm. And, you know, I haven't been around long enough to really see the difference, but I trust Sepp and, and he likes this technique a lot more than baffle plates just because you're, you know, if you think about it, instead of having one point of protection, basically the whole thing is. Oh, and now sometimes they'll have multiple baffle plates. I've yeah. seen like four go in a damn one. Uh, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. But exactly. it is expensive to do. Yeah, <coughs> yeah. The Paradise Dam at um, at Jeff's place, the biggest dam on the property, has got the the monk. Oh, nice! In there, very nice. But one day Jeff found this black poly pipe down uh -huh. in one of the gullies below. Uh -huh. He said, "Is this some scrap pipe?" And he reefed on and actually broke the valve <laughs> off the base of the dam, <laughs> and it had never been cemented or stabilized. Uh -huh. So it's like we had no way to stop the water flow. It was middle of winter, and it's like dive to find because his monk. It's oh not, wow. he's just got a stand pipe. It's yeah. not really a monk, it's yeah. a stand pipe. Yeah. And it's like, try and find that to cap that in the middle of winter. Oh so, man. Yeah, it was an yeah. interesting little process. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> Which we, we, I tried diving, couldn't find it, but in the end, we, we actually fixed it by wrapping bicycle tube around uh -huh. the broken fitting and holding something together and then casting and cementing <gasps> okay. the whole thing because that's okay yeah, yeah, yeah. so w one thing i found was think about strategies for repairing parts on the bottom of the dam wall <laughs> that you're not exposed to yeah. water pressure it's yeah like, wow <laughs> <laughs> and water water is strong you get a lot of water pressure built up that's a lot of weight yeah, what is it? Seven pounds per gallon. If you think these are, you know, a million gallons, you're you have a lot of weight and pressure pushing on that. Um, so, 
<coughs> Sorry, you've got your drawing there shows the kind of the new lower bottom contour of the pond below what was the original surface area of the yep. land. Are you doing that just to simply get the materials you need to make the dam? Or are you doing that based on what you want the contours of the pond to be? Um, you're doing that off of, you know, big, digging out your deep zone, getting as much water retention as possible, and generating the material for this. And really, this is not, this is not really good to scale. You know, this would be more like something like this. It would, it would usually, especially right, you know, you have your proper batter off of here, but then usually you're going to be coming down to that base clay layer, uh, like in this. You know, this bottom of the pond at that point, that is that barrier clay layer. Um, and then there's this stuff on top of it as well, and the uphill sides. Are you trying to keep your mud pot full of water? Or is it level? Is it. It's pitched. Just it's No, it sh it's just sloped out. Um, is it to get it to drain? Just sloped downhill like that. Yeah. Yep. Just enough to drain. And then you also want to make sure, you know, you don't want that landing right at the foot of the dam. You want that coming out and this probably to be armored with rock. And then what I like to do is you have your, you know, your overland spillway might come out like this. And then your monk, I just have connect right back into it so you don't have to build any extra spillway. And so then the spillway as well, a really important piece of it is to have the rock set in the spillway. If you think of like a river or a creek, you're going to have a lot of different size rocks all stacked together. Or even like concrete, you have your larger <coughs> aggregate, your smaller aggregate, your smaller aggregate, and your binding aggregate. And so in this case, we're building the spillway into a clay layer, setting your big rocks first, and then filling in between those with smaller rocks and stacking the sediment size so that you get something that's really strong and holding up to water. And then also really important is that the stones are all placed very deliberately so that you don't get like a running bond beam or like an H joint in floor. You, you basically, you know, if the water comes through here, it hits this rock and then has to travel around. And then it hits this rock and has to travel around. So it's continuing to drop its force each way. So if you think, you know, you're laying out the spillway, if you have a line of rocks like that, the next ones are like <laughs> this, and then the next ones are like this, so that the water, it smacks into this rock, and then it smacks into this rock. It's not, you're not laying out a spillway like this that looks really nice, but then the water is just going to cut a channel through there. And then as far as stream crossings as well, you can usually find enough good rock, not always, but oftentimes you can find enough good rock on a site so that you can make stream crossings where basically you have bigger rocks that you can lay out like the tire tracks and you have your water flowing in these parts and you have dry rock on top so you can just cross through. Um, I think I actually pulled the picture out that showed it well, but there are a couple of crossings. So this shows the two ponds. And so this pond is really the primary sediment <coughs> trap. That pond is just a hot pond. It's got a monk here that comes through there. It's got the overland spillway here that then comes back into here. And then this, we <coughs> also have a system where it can pull water from up here, pump it up into a waterfall up here, and circulate it through the system. Because the spring flow is so low, and if you really want to grow fish, you want to have a lot of oxygen, a lot of moving water, a lot of flow coming into it. If this was in a different situation where it had more flow year-round, I wouldn't worry about putting in a system like this, but this is basically a way to add oxygen to move water through the system so that you can pump from that bottom pond up to a waterfall, comes down through a spillway, so it's being cleaned in the spillway, it's being cleaned in this pond, which will eventually be plants everywhere except for just that little middle part. Um, this was just done in the fall and just filled and these are the first pictures I have so it's not showing all the stuff that's happened since. Um, but then flowing through this spillway getting filtered again into this flat zone of the pond being filtered again going down into the deep zone. So you're getting a lot of different filtration mechanisms but that are also producing the food for your fish that's also flowing like this. How do you and pump it up? A, a pump, electrical pump. Oh, okay. Yeah. You can, if you have a lot of flow, you can work with like a ram pump or a high lifter pump or something like that that's using a certain part of the water. Most of the water is traveling by to pressurize the amount of water that you're moving uphill. 
but in this kind of case where you have a spring that's four gallons an hour, you're not doing anything like that um, because you'd waste too much water to pressurize the water that you're moving back uphill. And so this is just to show you guys a little bit as far as pond siting. You know, you really want to look at, in most climates, if you just dig a hole and even if it's totally watertight and you get a lot of rain, you're not going to have a nice pond because if just what's landing in there, you're going to lose that much to evaporation. And so it might even get drier and drier every year. Certain climates you can, but those are the exceptions. So what you want to look is the watershed. Where is all the water flowing and where are the best places to trap it? And so if you see, this is a contour 3D map. You know, this whole watershed is all flowing through this one point. And so you have this one point where you can build a little tiny dam, make a nice water feature, and catch the water from this whole watershed is all flowing through there. And then the same thing back here with even larger watersheds. You have all these different contours. The water is all coming down and being collected into these few places where you can make the smallest amount of earth moving for the maximum amount of water retained. So if you look at some of these, you know, this is a little tiny dam for a pretty nice big lake. It's the same kind of thing as you saw with the site that SEPT did in the Extremadura in Spain. You're looking for the points, and I actually draw a comparison of a ratio of how many cubic meters of water am I storing per cubic meters of dam built what's that ratio like? And that's how you can start to decide, okay, well this pond site, I'm getting a lot more for my money than this one. And this one, I'm actually getting more money, for more water for my money than this one, but this one's better than this one. And so you can decide which ones you do first, which ones you don't do, which ones are gonna be your best leverage points to be able to shift the ecology of the property and the water cycling of the property. You and I have talked about this before, but why would you go with open water instead of water meadows? Um, well, so this is this is actually both of those because it's that you know because you're storing that water uphill too, you're not just creating the water feature, but you're creating the wetlands feeding into the water feature, and so you're getting two birds with one stone basically. Um, you're you're creating both of those features as part of a unit and that's why i think this type of dam building is so critical and so important because if you just make a basin pond you're missing that whole all of that water storage also all that water filtration also that water storage that's more prevented against evaporation you're getting all of those things when you do this type of dam and so that's these are the kind of water retention features that I'm always looking for and that are going to provide the most value for the minimum amount of expense, ecologically, economically, from an energetic standpoint, all of those things. What if you have no undisturbed ground for the spillway? <coughs> um, if you have no undisturbed ground for the spillway, that's a good question. Um, I haven't run into that before. I would be looking for the firmest ground and also where it's going to have the safest point of travel. So, <coughs> for example, or actually, I can do this here. Um, you know, if you wouldn't, the farther away you can get this spillway and any possible erosion away from the dam, the better. So, even if this was all disturbed ground, you know, having it spill like that is about the worst thing you can do because it's going to slowly eat away at the foot of your dam. You want it to spill yeah. out here and then down so that any potential erosion that's really going to happen is well away from your dam. Um, and that's, that's what I'd like to do if there's no undisturbed ground as well. And also looking at you know how disturbed is it, I would probably, if it's disturbed and loose, I would probably pull it up and compact it first to get it as firm as possible. Um, but usually there's going to be some area, you know, all your soil may be disturbed in the first couple <coughs> of feet, but oftentimes you're building this spillway into something deeper than that on the side of the hill. So even if all of your topsoil has been disturbed, that's not really what you're putting the spillway in anyway. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd be surprised if you can't find some undisturbed okay. uh, subsoil. So um, one question I've got two is, and, and then there's a bigger question, is that so we're concentrating on natural natural catchments. Mm -hmm. 
So all that work is about finding the natural catchments, you know, getting your, your earth to water volume ratios as best you can. Yep. Um, do you believe or do you practice strategies of increasing catchments, say by using um, road accesses mm -hmm. with healed in or putting you know, a ditch on contour of no more than say one in 400 or one in yeah. 600. Yep. And then the bigger question above that is, um, all these things are catching water in a certain point in the landscape. Do you have strategies about actually infiltrating the water higher up in the landscape also? Yep. Because these yep. only work on natural catchments or we, where we can arrange to catch water running off. Yeah, yeah, yep. And yep. of course, if we don't, if we've got beautiful soil, it's absorbing the moisture, we don't have that runoff. Yeah, so, yep. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So that brings up a couple of good questions. I absolutely do do things to increase the catchment. Yep. And also you can really get diligent and mathematic about it and say, okay, I have this amount of area feeding through this point. I know that my yearly rainfall is this. You can figure out a rough runoff coefficient of the land and you can figure out how much water is moving through these points in a yearly basis with a one inch storm, with a two inch storm, with all these different variables. And so you can really get diligent making sure that, you know, it's one thing to figure out, okay, I can have a reservoir this big for a dam this big. Is it ever going to fill? Do you get that much rainfall? What is your yearly evaporative losses? Figure out all of those things to then justify the size ponds that you're doing. And the spillway calculation. And the spillway calculation, exactly. Um, and so it's really important to consider those factors. And then as far as infiltrating water in the upslope areas, that's really where you're where I'm looking to do systems of forest and trees, or sorry, terraces and forests. Yep. And so you're putting more of that water into the soil. And then another important thing is these type of ponds are not dependent on runoff from the soil surface because that water that does infiltrate and then hits this barrier layer up higher in the landscape is getting down into the pond. So whereas a basin pond that's really dependent on surface runoff to fill, the more water you infiltrate in these uphill areas, the more water is eventually coming into your pond and at the times you most need it. So if you have a nice terraced forest landscape uphill of here, you know, even though the rain, the last rain may come in May, water's still coming into your pond in August potentially. So now you can really use that infiltration to your advantage because you don't need the surface runoff. You don't want the surface runoff. You want the subsurface water to be filling your water retention landscapes. Would the, the infiltration happen under <coughs> paving if it's like a driveway? No. Um, it's just going to sheet right off on top of the driveway. And so that's where you'd look to do like your roads as collection surfaces. Roads, homes, any type of collection surface you have, I'm always trying to put those into water features or gardens or use that water as, as well as you can. The other thing is you can replace roads and driveways with surfaces that do allow infiltration. So a paved driveway is going to allow no infiltration. A hard compacted gravel driveway is going <coughs> to allow a little bit of infiltration. Um, but now they do have these new areas that they use a lot for parking areas where they do pavers that are, um, they're kind of like a, it's kind of like a concrete block. I don't even remember the shape that they're usually in, but they're maybe so something like that. Yeah. Exactly. So, th so that <coughs> your car is riding on the hard concrete bits, mm -hmm. but this can actually be softer soil that can infiltrate the water. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's a great way to offset the environmental impacts of a road surface or a driveway. Let me ask it a different way. Beyond my driveway, there's a big lawn hill. Mm -hmm. Is it likely that the water is going down into the ground and then coming infiltrating mm -hmm. under my driveway? Yes. Yep. Okay. Oh, but depending on the layers, you know, if it depends on how, how much infiltration you have, where those layers okay. are. Okay. Um, but yes, very likely that it to some extent is happening. Okay. And just, uh, you know, if you think, uh, if you have your flow down here, doing something hard that does nothing in terms of letting water be absorbed doesn't really impact anything that's going on down here. Yeah. And then the other thing is if you have just a surface pond, you may be missing most of your water that's traveling in some sur <laughs> subsurface layer that because you just have a basin-lined pond or a liner pond, 
it's it's totally out of your loop. Mm. Uh, and this is the really important, you know, it's been filtered and cleaned by the earth's body. That's the really important water, the really vital water. The surface water can is a lot easier to be contaminated and have different nitrate issues and all sorts of different things that are not necessarily advantageous for a pond. And if you've got a liner and you actually have a leaky situation, you can get things like the liner floating. And exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so now I'm just going to take you guys through some of the stuff that I saw at the Holzerhof, which is same as Sepp's father gave the farm to Sepp. He gave the Kramerderhof to his son Josef, who now runs it, and he moved to southeastern Austria, Bergenland, <coughs> which is a much hotter place, a much drier place. They have twice the annual temperature and half the moisture. So if you think a much different situation than the Kramaderhof, um, and very interesting nonetheless. And so this is a situation where about 15 years ago now, he actually worked on this property. It was owned by someone else for a client. They came in, they made the terraces, they made the water retention features, they planted the trees and the vines, and then for about 10 years, there was no maintenance or very little maintenance. And when I started going there, which was right at the end of that period, he ended up buying the property. And from the beginning of the year to the end of the year, there's food falling on the ground everywhere. And you can see all sorts of ways that it could be much better with a little bit of human care and maintenance. But it was really apparent and really impressive to me how much is possible if you just set things out in the right direction and then let the ecosystem do its thing. And so all sorts of different types of nuts and fruits and <coughs> falling all over the ground all the year round uh, from a place with almost no management. And so when you know what's possible, and you know how to work with the landscape, all of these kinds of things, doors open. So this is an area where this is actually a spring terrace. And so because of the shape of the geology, Sepp actually created a spring here where he's harvesting that subsurface flow. Um, and I can go into this later if we have time and actually collecting it into a reservoir here that is then the drinking water for his house. And so this, feature that people thought he was crazy, there's no way that's going to work, is now producing five liters a minute, for which is enough for your household <coughs> means, some garden, not a lot of water, but, you know, taking a landscape that was producing no water that the farmer sold because he couldn't grow anything there, is considered to be wasteland, but when you know what to look for and how to work with it, you know, he's got water springing out of the ground of the very same place that someone sold because they thought it was worthless. Are they calling that a human spill? That's what, so Paul has a concept that's based off of this, that's a little bit different, that he calls a humus well. <coughs> Paul, Paul keeps asking me questions. <coughs> uh, that's a, a long story that I'm not going to get into, um, <laughs> as far as how the property ended up getting to him. Um, I'm just going to glance over that. Because <laughs> it's, yeah. Yeah. It's uh, yeah, <laughs> in in Austria. There's this whole system where if someone sues you, you can counter sue them, and so he ended up with the property. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so when you know what to do and how to do it, you know you can make these small little maneuvers that seem quite large at the time, but in the context of time you're really just bringing in the machine once to do what you need to do, and then you're working with it from that point forward. And you can have a landscape full of beauty, full of water. This is an area, too, where everyone is water scarce. All the farmers are dealing with drought issues, and yet sep has got water year-round. He's got water sitting in the landscape. He's got trees growing and using that water, and he's getting the property more and more into that <laughs> Why is to <this> skip past? <laughs> uh, he's getting that property more and more into the full water cycle where you're really using the earth's <coughs> body to hold the water and to cycle it appropriately. Um, and this is actually an area, you know, it's really important to look at the resources you have and look at the best ways to meet your goals with the minimum amount of effort. And so this is a beautiful little mature um, nut tree forest that Zepp basically made this nursery terrace. Uh, where are we? 
I think I took that picture out, sorry. Um, but he made this nursery terrace where all of these nuts just kept rolling down this really steep hill, and so they weren't really able to germinate ever. He just came through and with one hour with the machine, created a terrace. He's done nothing else, and he has thousands of dollars of different trees just sprouting out all over there that because he just saw this, he observed and saw that, you know, why aren't more of these trees germinating? Oh, there's too much disturbance with the steep grades. Cut a terrace to hold a little bit more water to hold the seeds, let them germinate. And now he has this nursery that he doesn't water, he doesn't plant, he doesn't do anything other than just dig plants out and put them in other places. So really looking at the natural resources you have and how to best leverage them to meet your goals. And you, get, you can get this landscape of just crazy productivity. These are grapes growing all over the trees because they've just gone wild. Now harvesting is a big challenge here, but <laughs> there are so many grapes produced here. And in years where it's really bad, where other people have total crop failure, he still has a really good crop going. And so there's actually some wineries this past year they had basically a total crop loss and they ended up harvesting seps grapes to be able to still produce wine to be able to keep up their brand because <coughs> his ecosystem is so resilient that even in the dry years where it means a total loss for someone else he still has food at growing out of his ears basically and you get this really beautiful productive landscape that's also very valuable when you look at the long-term value of these landscapes it's not as quick to harvest as a pine monoculture, but it's a lot more valuable over its lifetime. You know, all of these woods, chestnuts are really valuable wood, pears are really valuable wood, apples are really valuable wood. All these different crops that are more long-lived are also a really valuable timber when you get to that point. And you're also getting the yields off of them in the time in between. So you plant a walnut tree, it's producing nuts. Maybe you're eventually turning those nuts into pig. And then you're eventually still harvesting that walnut tree that's fetching a price 10 times what a pine would be. But because it's broken out over a longer time scale and over different yields through time, it's harder for people to value. So because are black walnuts uh, with the thujone, uh, is there a way to mitigate the thujone? You know, I think way too much of a deal is made out of allelopathic plants. <coughs> um, I think sometimes their net benefit is more than their net drawback. So I actually, uh, you know, some flowers are allelopathic. Jerusalem artichokes are allelopathic. I think that's one of the things where theory can cripple people. And I've seen lots of stuff growing under walnut trees. Um, so it's, uh, you know, I, I never let someone's theory about something like that prevent me from trying things. What I've observed is the drier the landscape, the more effect that allelopathic mm -hmm. system has. Yeah. Because as you know, coming from the rainforest, you can plant a black walnut out there and everything grows underneath yeah. it. Yeah. And you're hacking back brush so you can harvest nuts, put down, put down drop cloth so you can harvest nuts. So it, it, almost all of it depends on hydrology from what I've observed so far. Exactly, exactly. And so if you're addressing that point first, all these other things become less of a hindrance. Uh, and so you get this vital landscape that, you know, 20 feet down is full of life, where you can dig down and find roots and find earthworms and find water. You're really trying to rehydrate and re-enliven the living crust of the earth. Thomas <laughs> says you need a dirty mind to have food growing out your ears. <laughs> <laughs> and so when you try and work against nature, when you try and trick it with monoculture, everything needs the same resource at the same time, and it's not there. It's all going for the same amount of water from the same horizon in the soil, and so you get disease, you get drought, you get stress, you get angst, angst for the future, people start acting out against each other, you get this whole cascade of effects from this negative feedback loop. But in, and this is literally taking a picture one direction of the uh, neighboring property, and then this direction of Sepp's property. Oh, oh sorry, this, this and this are the two back and forth. Um, and so you can see in the very same landscape, you can have this productive oasis that has all these different yields, different roots growing to different 
horizons in the soil, different plants using different nut nutrients, leaving different nutrients uh, as they basically cycle them that then get put back into the soil with the rain. And then they're also, as they're decomposing, they're fixing different nutrients, making them plant available. So it's really about diversity, not simplicity, about harmony between the different natural elements rather than just trying to focus on one. And so you can get these really productive fruitful, amazing landscapes that not just are very lucrative from an economic sense and an ecological sense, but they're also just very enjoyable. They're beautiful places. They're full of natural beauty and all the living things around. And so here, I like these pictures because they just really show clearly how these systems are interplaced. So you have the forest with terraced through them, then these terraced areas that were uh, tillage agriculture in the past that are being transitioned into trees that are infiltrating, storing that rainwater, going down into those layers, and then eventually making their way into water retention features to hold on to that water throughout the year and from year to year. And you, you know, it's really moving. I'm just amazed at how in the early 1900s, Victor Schauberger just hit the nail on the head with the full and half water cycle and we've been in the half water cycle for more than 2000 years and so it's hard to even tell what used to be because this degradation is so severe and extreme uh this is actually that nursery terrace that i was uh alluding to where basically this is a nice mature nut tree forest and he just cut a terrace through and has all sorts of different nursery plants basically available to be planted to other areas and so this spring terrace, uh, basically what was done is so if we're looking at an overhead contour elevation, this is something like this, a little bit shallower than that. But so there's this forest and this basin that's you know, this watershed is feeding through this area. And he was digging around in this area doing test slices and found that deep down there was this hard barrier clay layer that the water wasn't going to be able to go through. And so in this area, he cut this big wide spring terrace and then in the back of that terrace laid a pipe. So basically back and along here laid a pipe where it's just down into that clay layer and then you've got a pipe with slits on the top two thirds, but not on the bottom. So the water can infiltrate into this pipe and then it flows along the bottom to where you want to collect it. Then this gets wrapped with washed round gravel. It's important that it's washed so it's not slowly filling with sediment. And then sometimes you'll wrap this with geotextile, sometimes not, depending on the situation, depending on what you want to do. The reason that you would wrap it with geotextile is to prevent finer sediment from moving into this gravel layer and eventually clogging up this pipe. And so what he has is he has this, really it's a French drain pipe laid on top of that impermeable clay layer that then pitches this way and pitches this way and then feeds to a T to a cistern here where this builds up and because the terraces and trees above where that nursery area is are infiltrating more groundwater and then it's coming along that barrier layer into this system and then being fed into here and now he's got five liters per minute of drinking water out of a out of a place that no one thought that would have been possible um, so it's you know, don't let anyone ever tell you it's not possible. Try it for yourself and see what's really possible and not. And I think it's really important to, you know, we're so scared of failure. You've got to have no fear of failure. And you've got to, even beyond that, you've got to revel in your failures. And when you have a failure, enjoy it and learn everything you can from it and totally engage in it. And then you can really start to move forward and do some of these really incredible things that no one thinks is possible. Uh, and another thing, you know, he really is focusing on the specialty crops, the crops that no one else is engaged in. If everyone's doing it and you're trying to produce for the commodity market, you're really 
putting yourself as at a disadvantage. So this Karelian cherry is a really marketable, sought after crop, but a very select thing. It's actually an edible dogwood cherry. Uh, it's really tart until the few days that it's really ripe. They really like it for schnapps making and different things like that. But so really identify and select crops that are gonna make the most use of your time harvesting the crop so that you're getting a good yield and a good return on your time investment on the farm. And another thing that I like to touch on is as far as seed saving, you always want to save the seed from the best plant on the worst soil. A lot of people think the best plant on the best soil. But what you're doing now is you're creating a weaker and weaker plant over time. You're creating a plant that thrives with really good soil, but does poorly with bad soil. And so say you've got a garden full of lettuces that are doing really nice but then there's a lettuce growing on the side of the road in the gravel that's still kicking it, that's the <coughs> seed you want because now you're getting stronger and stronger plants over time. And so he has some amazing genetics of stuff. You know, this guy is six foot tall. That's a sunflower. This is also a sunflower <laughs> skyrocketing out of view. I mean, he has sunflowers that are three meters tall and it's from saving the seed from the best plant on the worst soil so they get stronger and stronger and stronger every year and you don't want weak plants you want strong plants that are going to grow themselves that are going to be self-sufficient and the more you can do to enable that the better your time investment is going to be on the land and so it's really a different strategy of a fundamental partnership with nature uh, this is just a natural beehive you know, I think bees are a great example where everyone's worried about colony collapse disorder and all these different things and what are we going to do about pollinators. And look at the way that people keep bees. They smoke them all the time. They open up the hives all the time. They truck them all over the place and then they worry why they're dying. And then they rob the food from them going into the winter that the honey is their medicine that has all these important things, not just sugars. And then they give them crappy refined sugar water. If we did that with anything else, what do you think is going to happen? And so it's really important to develop a fundamental partnership with nature where you're looking at the best ways to maximize the systems naturally in place. With um, what strategies would you, s or w what's the point that you can scale down to? I know it's a depends question, but a lot of these things are very large scale. Mm -hmm. So on, on the smaller scale, say where, because we're all limited by our property boundaries yep. often, Whereas we, we could design better if we could design by integrating with neighbours. Yep. But if yep. you can't do that, how do you, like, you know, strategies and techniques for those smaller property sizes, you know, three to five, mm -hmm. eight, ten, twenty acres? I think in a lot of ways it, it actually gets easier on smaller properties because you have more time per acre. More, manage more management. More management, exactly. Yeah. So you're going into more managed intensive systems but maximizing the resources you have, you know, more small garden type systems rather than these big grandiose landscapes. Mm -hmm. uh, but a really important thing that I always do is when you're first envisioning a property and imagining what you can do, I throw out property lines. I try and envision what's possible on the area around the property so that I really see what's natural, what's the best fit for this landscape not including the lines that people drew through it. And then you've got to make an assessment of, okay, here's the property lines. How much does that limit us? And a lot of times, for example, actually two different projects I was just on in the East Coast, their best pond location is just a little, you know, part, most of it would be on their property, but the dam would actually be a little bit off. And so if you were just to design the property itself, You'd never even think about that. But a lot of times it's fairly easy to just do a lot line division where you say, hey, I want a half an acre here where it's your wetland bottom. You're not using that for anything. Can we switch so that you take a half acre here? I take a half acre here. Usually that's a, well, not usually, but oftentimes that's a fairly easy agreement to do with your neighbor. And so I think it is important to look at <coughs> where you are within the landscape as a whole. And then that kind of informs what, you know, not every three to five acre property is going to have a good pond site on it. Yep. And you shouldn't try and create a good pond site just because you want a pond. You want to look at the landscape as a whole. Let it tell you. Exactly. So it's exactly. It's context based. Yep. Yep. And so fit into where you are in the landscape and do the things that, 
makes sense in that location, not just trying to, okay, I want my swales and I want my pond and I want my food forest, so I'm going to plug all these elements into this property that may not be fitting for any of them. Maybe you have a property where the best thing is, I don't know, something entirely different. Maybe it's a forest system or maybe it's a meadow system or a steppe or you want to look at where you are within the whole ecological context and then also not let your thinking be limited by the current state of the ecosystem but be looking at what it may have been like historically and what the possibilities are like for the future. So in like in holistic management you talk about your future resource base and you talk about it as though it's already there. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, 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 exactly. And so I've just got to say a tremendous thanks for Sepp for leading me into this path and teaching me so much. It's really these last five years have totally shifted my view of the world and my view of the landscape. And before then, I was a well-intentioned person, but they had a lot of theoretical knowledge, but no real applied way to make the earth a better place to restore some of these environmental problems. I did a university degree in ecology and you learn about all of the issues. You don't learn about any of the solutions and that all I gained from really a short time working with this person who is just an incredible person, one of my favorite people. Um, he's a powerful, relentless, visionary human being. I highly recommend if you get a chance to learn from him. Um, or just looking into his teachings, reading his books, watching the DVDs, you can really gain a lot. But really, nature is the ultimate guide. Nature is, the last time I was with Seth, he said, nature is my lawyer. <laughs> 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 because he's had all these litigation problems, but then, you know, he ties them up in court long enough that it looks like this beautiful paradise, and so a jury of your peers are not going to rule against you usually at that point. Uh, and so really do what's right for your landscape and for yourself and don't let the rules hinder you don't let the theory cripples hinder you the best thing is to make experiments see what happens and let nature be your guide you know don't choose any one person and listen to everything they say take everything with a grain of salt take everything i've just said with a grain of salt figure it out for yourself it's applied knowledge not things that are just passed on like this so this is my business i do um, contracting and consulting all over the place and I'm going to be this year adding a lot more educational pieces to my website because I'm really trying to get as much of this knowledge out there for free as possible um, and yeah any questions uh, yes could you throw out a couple uh, more technique buzzwords or technique uh, methods of uh, collecting water other than ponds and the things you kind of went over, some some like trails that we could go down, you know, when we went home to look for other. Um, you know, uh, that's a good question. I try and actually stay away from the technique buzzwords because a lot of times people get so wrapped up with the technique that they forget to address their context. Um, so, you know, let's just look at for a second rainwater catchment off of a roof. What kind of climate are you in? How much water do you get? How much are you going to be collecting? What is your storage vessel? A lot of times people say, okay, they want to do rainwater collectment. So they get this little 50 gallon drum, they put it on their spigot, it rains, it fills up, it totally overflows. Then three months from now when they really need the water, that 50 gallons has already been used. So a lot of times people get into these techniques and they feel really good, they're doing green things and they're making an impact, but it's not actually delivering a result because if, you're, if you have a 50 gallons of water storage and you have four months where you have no rain, by the time you really need the water, it's already been spent. And so I think it's important to not just grab onto these silver bullets <coughs> like a swale or like a hugo culture or like rainwater catchment. Really look into your situation and the best way to do it. Um, and I really think that the, the body of the earth is the best place to hold water. So I don't do a lot of rainwater. I mean, I'm doing a lot of rainwater catchment in that these water features are all fed by rainwater but it really takes a select situation where you really need it for it to be worth the economic and ecological costs of the resources involved, be it 
concrete tank, a rubber tank, all of those different things. Um, well, I guess, I mean, I mean, you kind of said a few right there. Yeah. You know, assuming that we could go and evaluate these systems and learn about them. Yep. Not things that we would just go implement, but like, yeah. you know, you said swales and some other things. I mean, just, yeah. you know, because I don't think like a pond would really work for me, uh -huh. so to say, yep. but yep. I would like to do something. Yep. Um, so just, you know, I need some little feeders. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think if, you know, if you're in the areas where ponds are not an option, I really look at how to ramp up the biology so looking at living soils, particularly like Elaine Ingham's work, Paul Stamets' work, how to really get that soil dealing with water as well as possible, doing really heavy mulches, getting it really biologically active, getting that cryptobiotic crust on everything so that you're venting eva preventing evaporation, you're getting good tree cover. Um, looking into Victor Schauberger's forestry work is something I'd highly mm. recommend. I think he's one of the best sources out there, and there's uh, a staggeringly little amount of resource available on this kind of stuff that I've come across that I really like. Um, one acre of one inch mulch over like a forest floor holds over 27,000 gallons of water. Yeah. So that's way there more than go. you can do with 55 gallon drum around <laughs> your house. Yeah, yep, yep, yep. And now you're using natural materials and you're partnering with nature, that's the thing is there's all of these connections in the natural systems that if you can get tied into that, they're gonna feed you so much with all these different beneficial relationships. If you're taking that resource and instead putting it into a plastic tank, it's just in the plastic tank. It's not being cycled, it's not creating other connections that are delivering other results. It's really just um, a dead system. I think it's fundamental too to try and retain every drop of water on that square, you know, square meter or whatever, that that's what you've got to work with. Yeah. If it's going somewhere else, it's not working for you. But if you can trans, like, get it. If you can, as it leaves the soil, it's going through plants, then it's doing its job. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And how many times can you use the water? Yeah. You know, every place gets enough water. The m worst deserts of the world used to be some really fertile places. It's about how many times do you use that water? How are you, are you treating it when it first falls on the surface? And then how many times is it used before it leaves your property? This is why I never understood economics. <laughs> <laughs> I don't yeah, it's, understand it's not how measuring you totals, it's measuring flow. And yeah. flow, is, flow is a lot more flexible than totals. Exactly. And there are calculations in the student notes about working out um, uh, rainwater catchments off roofs and good ideas about um, you know sizing tanks which is basically work out the tank that you can that um, that will do the job for you and then at least picking the next largest size tank is always a good strategy and some links to you know pathogens in tank water and all that sort of stuff but thanks nice. yeah we all good no more questions I think we're right at lunchtime too right a little bit past a little bit fast, but that doesn't matter because... We're oh, I've got more stuff I can fill, too. Go, go. Okay. We want you to oh, stay okay. here with 12. absolutely nothing left in the oh, tank. Sorry. <laughs> exactly. Anybody yeah. who was waiting for coffee at break, I would assume that the new batch is ready by now. Is it okay if I bring up that sawdust, yeah. that sawdust pond thing we talked about, the peat bog pond? Yeah. Okay. So, for some of you people that are in dry lands, one of the things that makes sense is to put biology in the landscape. So instead of having an open water pond, you take peat moss or something biological, you use sawdust in one place. Or we just dug the pit, followed the hydrology, dug the pit, filled it full of sawdust, capped it with dirt, and let it sit there and become a subsurface bog. It's holding water in the landscape, it's infiltrating it, but the landscape's too dry to leave something exposed to the air if you can't cover it, if you can't shade it. So we just, we put a cover crop over it, but that's our reservoir, that's our pond. Wood chips from, uh, you know, tree felling, would that work? In this particular instance, that worked rather well. It's like hugelkultur, really. Yeah, it's essentially hugelkultur in the bed. 
but ponds come in a lot of different forms. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of this stuff, I couldn't do in the rainforest in Coquille. It would be impossible to get down to a base layer deep enough to be able to put a dam out there that's going to stay. Because my rain event, my 24 hour rain event, like we talked about, is 30 some odd <laughs> inches. <laughs> at, at, at the thousand year. year. You're not going to hold that much water back. I mean, that's what the forest is for. But you can do things like the infiltration systems where it's, uh, uh, I mean, even a gravel column in some places will work. Or you just dig a pit and fill it full of gravel and cap it with dirt. In that situation, would you almost want to put the pond at a high point so that your spillway is effectively the whole rest of the hill? Well, that's the thing, is the spillway is the whole rest of the hill. The, the, the Kokio River Valley headwater. Mm -hmm. It's a forest. The forest is your pond. Yeah. You know, that's your, that's your water reservoir. And it really does depend on what's, what's the geology that you're working with. And it's depends, depends. so many times, you know, 10 meters away, I hit an entirely different geology. So don't let anyone tell you, oh, you can't build ponds here. Or, oh, it's this or oh, it's that. You know, yeah, in the one section that they tried it was, but you really want to see for yourself because it's different solutions in all the different types of geologies. Sometimes you want to, you know, sometimes a swill would be the worst thing you can do. Because you're going to open up, you know, say you have an area where you have all this sandy material and then you have a nice topsoil silty loam. So this is, you have no opportunity for water retention that's going to stay around. So really you want to keep it in this living layer as long as possible. Now cut a swale into that living layer. Now all this water is infiltrating into the sand layer, moving downhill and can actually cause landslides and big issues because you're putting water somewhere that it's not used to flowing. Oh, yeah. um, so it's, it's so important to look at the geology and every situation is entirely unique based on what's above, what's downhill, what's the actual soils you're working with, what's the major farming materials, all these different questions. So it's, you know, you really want to have a good idea of your geology and not a soil sample of the top little bit that you send off to a lab and say, okay, I have 30% clay and that has no bearing on what's down here, no bearing on what's down here. So you want to actually see, you know, it's like earthen spelunking. What, what are your actual layers that you're working with in the ground? Can you hand dig those if you don't have a backhoe? You can. <laughs> if you have a, I actually, I go for it, go. Yeah, one, <laughs> one in Africa, we did one that was, I don't know, 15 feet deep. Um, but it took a day. <laughs> Before you got to the clay, right? Uh, well, we actually, that was, that's this whole different you know what I'm scenario. Looking for is the, but the clay, right? The firm clay layers? Yeah. You, well, yeah, but you're also, y that's what you're looking for as far as building a water retention feature. Yeah. Um, but you're also <laughs> looking for the other details as far as if a water retention feature isn't possible, what are your best practices at that uh -huh. point? Uh -huh. You know, do you want to keep the water up here? Do you want to get it going down here? Where where do you want it? How do you want to work with it? I just it? want to know when I can stop digging. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> when I when I hit the clay or well, and not all clays are the same. So, uh, and then you want to go into the clay because if you just hit a layer of clay that's that deep, that's yeah. not enough to tie it in. So. So go a little bit more. And you know, machines are so cheap in the states. The reason that we did it by hand in Africa is because. A piece of equipment There's is seven hundred dollars an hour, yeah. so oh. whereas oh. labor is ten dollars a day. So, but here, you know, someone with a backhoe that's your neighbor is going to charge you like fifty bucks an hour to come do a test slice. You know, if you looked at paying people to dig that same hole, you're going to save money with the machine here. Um, okay, how f how deep should one go then? Based on what you find, so usually. Because you don't know what you hit, I'm looking for a machine that can dig 6 to 12 feet deep, okay. maybe 15 feet deep. Okay. Once you get below 15, 20 feet deep, you start <coughs> to get to this point where you're really expensive to build something into that layer uh -huh. already, so it, you start to get to diminishing returns. You know, if you, if you have all permeable material down to 20 feet, which is where your clay layer is, that's a tough situation to build a pond in. So usually you'd go with a different strategy at that point. Do you have a ratio of um, 
So if you're running out terraces, do you have a ratio based around width of terraces to the trees up uh, above and below in terms of sunlight infiltration that you know it might be the width between the terraces is 75% of the height of the trees and usually it's more based on the slope of the terrain yeah so in a in a much steeper terrain You'll you're going to end up with much yeah. narrower farther spread apart terraces yep. in a much flatter terrain you can go bigger so in really flat terrains you start to look at terrace width with shading and things of that nature yep, yep. but usually um Usually a landscape like that, I'm not terracing the whole thing. I'm doing specific access terraces yep. to infiltrate water and open up access. So usually it's more based on the slope of the landscape rather than yep. the shading that you'd get with trees. How so do what, you avoid the hurting, I'm sorry, Tim. You are? How do you avoid hurting the feeder roots of the trees if you're terracing? Oh, well, a lot of times I'm terracing landscapes that are no longer treed, that used to be treed, mm -hmm. um, but then you also, you know, it's uh, wi working around trees, you're always making a judgment call. And I like to look at the scale of permanence, um, but kind of my own perverted scale of permanence, where if you do, you know, an earthwork should last a lot longer than any tree. Mm -hmm. And so to totally shift an earthwork for one tree, looking at the long term effect of your work may or may not be a good call. Now, at the same time, a hundred year old tree is not going to regrow within your lifetime mm -hmm. and you want to get the enjoyment of that mm -hmm. so it's it's a judgment call as far as what trees get disturbed and potentially removed and what trees you're working around and that's for each client to decide how how much they want to shift based on the trees that are on the landscape at the moment would it make any sense to like i'm just thinking about a rule of thumb like maybe the total number of years of experience on the team versus the age of the tree like if your team has three years of experience and you're looking at moving a 300 year old tree that might not be a good call yeah yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. versus like yeah, if you've got absolutely. you know three four teams that experience? have that have multi-generation farmers yeah. from that area yeah. and you've got some couple of engineers with 30 years in and you can yeah. you like you've got the time in the landscape to be confident that you're doing something that's going to be good for the long term yeah that might that might outweigh that hundred yeah. year old tree yeah 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 absolutely and i think also you know what condition is that tree in is it dying is it in a good condition is it you know a lot of times people hold on to these dying trees when really they're dying because of the poor land management all around and it's going to die anyway no matter what you do it may die in five years it may die in 10 years it may die in 20 years and now if the trees are really vibrant and living and producing well, you know, that's not really a degraded ecosystem that you have to do a lot of these changes in. And so most of the time you're dealing with, I'm dealing with um, really overgrown, recently cut, you know, within the last 50 to 100 years. Sometimes it looks different. You go to Salt Spring Island, a 50 year old tree is a six foot cedar. Um, but those are just like the weeds that grow up everywhere. So again, you don't really want to totally shift what you're doing because of a few of these trees that grow like weeds there. But then, you know, on a project in Pennsylvania I was just on, there's a hundred year old walnut that, yeah, we're going to work around that tree because it's a nice lineage tree that his grandkids are still going to be eating off of. Um, and it's throwing all sorts of nuts. So it's, it really comes down to a judgment call as far as w how much of the ecosystem you're disturbing and how much you're trying to work around. So what strategies in, in the areas that you're not terracing or doing the more intensive, um, intensive earthworks, what are your strategies and techniques about, and I'm assuming that the overall goal is to increase productivity mm -hmm. and, you know, and one of those baseline measurements is, you know, soil organic content. Mm -hmm. But what are you doing on the areas that you're not terracing in terms of strategies and techniques to bring those areas um, up in productivity? So, yeah. Um, looking, at, looking at the ecology that's in place and trying to get a good idea of what used to be there yep. and then the best ways to leverage that to meet the goals of a project. So. Sometimes it's replanting a lot of trees, sometimes it's heavy mulching, sometimes it's just doing a little disturbance and getting some cover crop going, sometimes it's running through a subsoiler like a key line plow. Yep. D you know, again, I'm looking at the different areas 
Uh, so, for example, I was just working on a place that's a horse farm in Pennsylvania. So they have these pastures that they don't really want to tree because they want to keep some of them as riding areas. But they have this really degraded pasture that's just been set stocking of the horses. It's super compacted. And so some of my recommendations to them were to run through a subsoiler to actually get that infiltration going down into it and then also getting in a cover crop and then also starting to apply some type of holistic animal management, more intense rotational grazing to increase the diversity. Um, so it's, you know, it's very different techniques based on, I'm always looking at the goals of the client, the natural capabilities of the landscape and the best ways to marry those. So I'm not necessarily always doing what I would like to see from an ecological standpoint on the landscape. It has to be something that also fits within their goals and context. Otherwise, the person isn't, it's not going to deliver the enhancement in relationship that I'm really looking for. <coughs> what part of Pennsylvania was that? Persiki? Persiki? Uh, <coughs> yeah. yeah. Close to Put New York Piyama? City and Fels, uh, in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. It's like 30 miles outside of the city. Per Casey. Per Casey, thank you. Uh, so. What about if you have mostly clay? Like, mm -hmm. I have Georgia red clay. Uh -huh. I don't know if that's conducive to uh, ponds. Oh, yeah. It's pretty gritty. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, I would want to know what percentage clay is it? What are the other things in it? And what are what is my geology as I'm going down okay. deeper into the layers? Clay. Four feet is Georgia red clay. Four feet is Georgia yeah. red clay. Yeah, you're in a great situation. I would love Very to. Very <laughs> <laughs> um, so you're really looking at, um, you know, clay is, in my opinion, the best soil to have, but it's the easiest to be abused. So it's the most likely to be compacted or heavily waterlogged or all these different issues, but it's got the best cation exchange capacity, it's got the best water holding capacity, it's got the most potential for putting in systems like this, and if you get it going right, it's by far and away the best soil to have in my opinion um, so that you know sometimes you're working with where this is just all clay and that's where you can do a dozer pond and it actually works out uh, because you don't have this fine sorting of material that you have to do you're working with a fairly uniform sediment Good. but of course with that thick layers where it's all clay then you're not getting those infiltrations in yep. your ponds. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And you're dealing more with surface runoff yep. and you're going to have a lot of erosion as it's picking up the fine material in the clays and so you need to focus more on you know, dropping as much of that erosion in the terraces as possible before it even gets to the pond so that right. they're not as murky. Um, and then also if you're all clay, you're going to have more expansion and contraction, and so you need to be very careful with the size and the building of dams. Sometimes you actually need to mix in other material to those downhill and uphill embankments to be able to really fortify it and have it be something that's going to be strong and not start creeping on you or things of that nature. Like what other material? Are you yeah, rock, rock, gravel, okay. sand. It's something that's going to firm it up a little bit because clay has a really strong ability to expand and contract with moisture mm -hmm. variations, and so you want something to to mitigate that. You know, if you're really in 100% clay, you need to be very careful about the dams that you're building. You're probably in something with some sand in it and some other stuff, and so I'd want to know, okay, am I 40% clay? Am I 60% clay? Am I 80% clay? I would do a mason jar test to really see how much clay you have and then what are the other things? Is it sand? Is it gravel? Is it silt? Is it organics? Um, and then you start to develop a plan from that. Okay. I'd like to thank you so much for that. That was really interesting. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Again, Zach, thank you for articulating what it takes me a thousand years to, <laughs> words to say takes you five. <laughs> One of these days I will learn that technique. <laughs> If you like this sort of thing, come on out to the forums at permies.com where we talk about sepulcher, homesteading, and permaculture all the time.
up the wall.